you know that there aren't many people who are willing to take a job at a morgue and that must be the reason that they pay such a good amount of money but looking at it I guess the money is still very less compared to the life-threatening experience that one can have in there. My name is Colin Thompson, and I'm currently 28 years old and working at a school as a security head. I got this job two months ago, and even though the pay is not as good, this one still is far better in comparison to the last one with the good money. It was about six months ago when I was searching for a job desperately, and that was when I came across this ad about a job at a morgue. It was for security and the pay was $50 an hour. I mean, it was good pay if I were to get this job. So I thought of going in there for an interview and called the number that was given there. They told me to come the next day for an interview at the address given in the advertisement, exactly at 11 in the morning, and then hung up the call. The next day I met a lady for the interview. She must be around the age of 40 or 45. She asked me about my experience related to the security field which I had for just two years at the time and if I could work during the nighttime or not. I did not want to lose this opportunity to earn some good money so I agreed to do whatever she said. She also asked me if I were to work more than 8 hours any day and I'll get an extra $20 apart from the hourly salary and apart from that meals would also be provided by them. I could not believe my luck to be this good. Not only was I getting a job that was paying well but also such great perks. Lastly, they told me that I could join the next day and then asked me to go. The next day, I was there on time. I know working at a morgue might sound a little bit creepy, which for me it was too, but it wasn't like there wasn't any harm in it. So I started my first day of work, which was going pretty well. And I decided to work past eight hours just to get the extra 20 bucks. As I was working, I heard some weird noises coming from inside the morgue. So I decided to go check. I quickly and quietly walked inside. When I reached one of the rooms where dead bodies were stored, I noticed the noise was coming from there. So I walked in to see one of the dead bodies outside the morgue refrigerator, which was pulled aside. I would be lying if I said I wasn't scared, which I was, but I still pushed it back and then locked the door from the cabin, which the dead body was in. After making sure the door was locked, I left the room as soon as I could. My eight hour shift had already ended and I was only there to spend another hour or so. So I decided as soon as the hour ends, I would leave after informing the person in charge. After about 15 minutes had passed, I again heard the same noises as before coming from inside. I did not want to go inside to check again, but since it was my job to do so, I had to go in there. As I walked in, I again stopped in front of the same room as earlier and the noise was coming from in there for sure. I hesitantly and trembling walked in there only to find the same dead body in the same condition as before. Trust me, I was scared as hell even more than before. But I still pushed the body back in and locked the door once again. I almost ran back to my seat and immediately dialed the lady's number. She picked up after the three rings. I told her that I would be leaving and surprisingly, she did not ask me to complete the hour, not even once. I ran back to my apartment in a cold sweat and I was shaking my feet from the horrified feeling that I was having. There was no way that I left the door unlocked at the cabin because I was sure to recheck it before leaving and what were those noises that I heard would stop the second that I walked into the room. All of these thoughts surrounded my mind which kept me awake the entire night. Even though I did not want to go the next day, I still did it, and I went to work. All night, I was just thinking, and it made me come to the conclusion that there was a possibility that the lock of the particular cabin may not be working, which caused the corpse to come out of its own. So I started working, and it was a relief that everything was quiet the entire time. My shift was about to end, and I decided not to stay another hour like last night. But as there were only 50 minutes left for my shift to end, I again heard a loud thud sound coming from inside. Without even realizing my legs felt heavy and started trembling as if they were asking me not to go in there. But I still had to go and check. So I walked in with silent footsteps and yet again stopped in front of the same room. After entering the room, I saw the same dead body which was lying on the floor this time. My legs gave up after the sight and refused to walk closer to the corpse. That was when its head moved on its own and my eyes were met with the eyes of a corpse that was looking straight into them. It made my blood run cold 
and I ran out of there while screaming. The noise it did not stop. Instead, it only got louder. While I was running back to my apartment, I dialed that woman's number and told her about everything that I just witnessed. She did not deny or protest against it, which made me think that she knew about the morgue being haunted. I told her that I would not be able to continue working there any further. Strangely enough, she called me the next day and asked me to meet in a restaurant. I was hesitant to meet her, but I still went there. As I reached the restaurant, I found her sitting in an empty corner of it, and there weren't many people around at the time as well. She handed me a check and said, Your salary is already credited to your account, and here's some extra money for you not to reveal the word about the morgue to anyone. If you want, I can write you a recommendation letter for your next job. I looked at her in a daze for a minute, and then I looked at the check from her hand. Even though I accepted her money, I refused any help from her to get a job because I wanted to find one on my own, with no further haunted experience involved. You're sleeping with your best friend's mother? My mom screamed at me the moment I walked into the house. This is not what it looks like. I'm not just hooking up with her, mom. I'm in love with her. I said in a calm voice. The cat was already out of the bag. What use would it be to try to seal the bag now? So I told her the truth. And what do you know about love? You're 16, Xavier, and she's 40. She crossed her arms and said all of this angrily. But I do love her, Mom. And she loves me too, I said. Yeah, hell she does. She doesn't love you. She's using you. The anger in her voice was so strong that it was starting to scare me. But I kept standing my ground and told her that if she does anything, I would leave the house. She started laughing in anger, which was even scarier. Then suddenly she stopped and said, You think after pulling that stunt, you have the luxury to threaten me like that? You don't get to leave the house by yourself, Xavier. I'm kicking you out. After saying that, she stormed upstairs while I stood there frozen, unable to believe my ears. I went to my room and started packing my stuff with the speed of a sloth, hoping she would change her mind and stop me. But she didn't. She didn't even look me in the eye when I was leaving the house, let alone speak to me. I had nowhere else to go. Not even to Miss Henderson's house because her husband still lived with her. She had made a promise to me that she would get a divorce from him once she sorted the matters about her grandfather's will, which stated that she would get the properties if she had stayed married to Mr. Henderson seven years after his death, and it had only been five years. When I told her about my mother finding out about us as a result and me getting kicked out, she asked me to manage for a few days until she figured some things out. The first night, I spent sleeping on my house's porch, and around 3 a.m., I even saw Mom peek in but she never asked me to come back in. The next day, my little brother came and told me that mom wants me to go sleep somewhere else. So I roamed around the next day with hopes in my heart that either my mom or Miss Henderson would call me, but none of them did. I understood mom was punishing me, but why was she ignoring me? She was the one who manipulated me into sleeping with her the first time, and that was not it. She was the one who persisted that we keep doing this, and that was the reason I fell for her. I had already spent two days sleeping on the street, but I was not going to sleep another day like that. So I decided to go to her house and confront her. When my affair with her wasn't discovered by my mom, I used to sneak into her house through the back door. So I thought of doing the same thing and went to use the back of her house. That's when I witnessed something really disturbing. She was kissing Jackson. He was a friend of Harry, her son, and mine. The three of us used to have sleepovers before my affair started, but now I know that it was not just me she was sleeping with. As I was thinking that while watching them, she pulled out a knife and stabbed him. I was dumbfounded and horrified as I stood there frozen. I always knew she was a violent person, but I never knew she could go to the extent to hurt someone. As she was stabbing him, I heard her saying with the calmest expression on her face, Only if you could have kept your mouth shut. I kept hiding there beside the window as I saw her dragging the body around and taking it somewhere else. 
I figured she was about to come to her backyard to bury the body, so I sneakily moved to the other side of her house from where I could see what she was doing. I was surprised her just leaving the body outside, going back in, and that was when I noticed her wearing rubber gloves. All at the same time, it hit me. She had planned it all along, and whatever plan she had made for me and Jackson must have ruined it. I knew she lacked empathy and was manipulative and aggressive, but this was beyond my imagination. She was a real sociopath. I couldn't just leave my friend's body like that, so I called 911 and went to check on him. Just when I thought he was dead, I felt his distinct faint breathing. Police had already told me that they would be here in 10 minutes, but I was just not strong enough to handle this on my own. So I called Mom. After the third ring, she picked up. Mom. I started crying after saying that, and she got worried. I told her about Jackson, and she immediately drove over to where I was. But before she could reach, Miss Henderson saw me and came outside. Oh my god, Xavier, what happened? Is this Jackson? Who did this to him? As she was asking me all of these questions with absolutely no remorse on her face, I felt disgusted by her. Don't worry, Miss Henderson, he was alive. He'll tell us himself about what happened once he wakes up. I said with tears dripping down my eyes. That was when my mom's car reached and she rushed to us. Get away from here! She pushed her and squatted down to check his pulse. He's alive, but not for long. We have to hurry and take him to the ER, she said. By the way, did I mention earlier that my mom was a doctor? I followed her advice and helped her carry him to the car. That was also when the police van showed up. As we put Jackson in the car to drive him to the hospital while one of the officers accompanied us, Miss Henderson was getting arrested. She looked at me with disbelief, because she couldn't believe her crime was witnessed by someone, let alone her teenage lover, but I didn't care to spare her another look. As we drove to the hospital, I kept thinking that my mom was right all along. She had been manipulating and using me all this time for her selfish gains. And I was just too stupid to notice that. During his entire lifetime, my grandfather was known to drop bombshells, whether it was about something as major as dropping off his position as the mayor, or something as minor as announcing his marriage at the age of 70 with a girl who was the age of his granddaughter. But the biggest bombshell he dropped before his death led to a major stir in my entire family. Anderson's family has always been one hell of a complicated one. My grandfather was a rich mayor of the suburb Sandhill. He achieved many things in his life, but as he grew old, he became a womanizer. Our entire family relied on him and never really thought of working on their own since Grandpa had several businesses that brought in pretty good income. My father was the one who used to work in one of his companies as a manager, so I was the only one among all our cousins who felt proud. My mother named me Robert after my grandfather's name. It didn't surprise me when I found out, because grandfathers have an entirely different form of respect in our families. So anyway, as I was telling you, my grandfather was a womanizer. He married and got divorced seven times in his entire life, and he had children from all the marriages. My father was the son of his fourth wife, Riley, and then there was my Aunt Teresa from his first wife my first uncle Carl from his second wife, my second and third uncles who were twins, Mark and Bruno. He had a daughter, Anna, from his third wife, who died from cancer at a very young age. And then he had another son, my fourth uncle, Mason, from his fifth wife. My aunt Freya, who was three years older than me, was in full custody of my mother, and so was my youngest uncle, who was five years younger than me, Sam. Aunt Freya and I were best friends since she often visited the house. Aunt Teresa was divorced and did not have any children. She wasn't planning on remarriage either. I total of four cousins, Henry, Uncle Carl's son, Rosaline, Uncle Bruno's daughter, Aaron and Oliver, Uncle Mason's sons. You can already understand that my family was the biggest one in the entire Sand Hill. 
As I mentioned earlier, apart from my father, no one else was interested in working, and they used to say, why bother working hard for more money when we already have tons? And it seemed my grandfather did not mind that either. Anne Freya's thoughts were that they were just lazy and selfish, that's why they didn't want to work. She was planning on starting her career when she finishes college, and so was mine. It was two years before Grandpa's death when he married this young lady, Samantha. Everyone was saying that she was a gold digger, and she did it only for the money, so they all hated her. But she lived quietly for the two years Grandpa was alive, and right before his death, he made a major announcement regarding his will. In his will, Grandpa had given the power over to Samantha, not his fortune. No, it was only the power to choose who would be worthy of succeeding it. Samantha would decide whom to name as heir after her careful consideration. She was excluded from the will, so she could not name herself. It looked like she did not need it either, since she already had a firm on her name. Now, Grandfather died a week after announcing his will but little did he know what kind of chaos it would bring to the family. Those who hated Samantha so much before Grandpa's death were now doing all sorts of things and going out of their way to impress her, which seemed pathetic. Just after one month after Grandpa's death, Uncle Carl and his son were murdered in their sleep. Even a fool would know that it was someone from the family who killed them. So the investigation started, and everyone from the family was on the suspect list. And in my opinion, it was only fair, because Uncle Carl and her son were a major threat to the rest of the family. It was not because he was legally first in line to inherit everything, but it was because he had started to earn Samantha's favor. When even after three months they couldn't find a single clue related to the murder, they put it on cold cases. Everyone was in a dilemma now because if Samantha had to be impressed by someone in the family, then they could end up getting murdered, and if they don't earn her favor, they could end up losing the inheritance. There were only a few people who were treating her just this way that they had always been. Father, Aunt Freya, Oliver, Aaron, and me. We were the only ones who were unaffected by the will, because we had already decided that we would be making our way to the top. And since Father was an employee in the company, He had a salary and employee benefits, such as a retirement plan, so he did not care about the will either. Trust was completely lost in the family, and everyone started to doubt each other. The entire family was a mess. Fights and arguments started to break out any minute. After eight months of the grandpa's death, Uncle Mason was also murdered. Everyone started to suspect my father and the twin uncles from the murder, but they kept denying it. Cases of the previous murders were open, along with the investigation of Uncle Mason's murder. I don't know how, but the police came to the conclusion that whoever murdered them was shorter, around 5'2 to 5'4, and there were only Aunt Freya, Rosaline, Oliver, and myself who came in this category. It was hard for me to believe any of us was capable of doing such a heinous crime for money. Another clue was found, and it was the ring mark on Uncle Mason's neck. It was believed it would have gotten there when the culprit strangled him, and we all knew that mark too well. So we told the police about it, and they took Rosaline for questioning, but she kept denying her involvement in the murder. No other clue was found after that, so they arrested her and started trials. This is exactly why I hate bombshells, Aunt Freya said. What should we do now, Aunt Freya? I asked as I walked in the backyard behind her, where she was planting some flowers. Nothing. We just wait and see what happens next, she said while burying the ring along with the plant. What if they find out? I asked in hesitation. Don't worry. No one will. He would have killed you too, just like he killed Carl and Henry if I did not act when I did, she said without turning back. But what about Rosaline? I squatted down near her while asking. Let me assure you, she was involved in this too. She sounded certain, so I did not ask her. All I thought next was that it was a good thing that no one knew about Grandpa giving the same ring to Aunt Freya as Rosaline.
Growing up, I watched the classic holiday movie Home Alone multiple times and never imagined that I would find myself in a similar situation. However, life took a dark turn, and the twist was anything but comedic. I found myself in a horror situation that seemed to have been taken straight out of a movie. The fear and uncertainty that came with the experience left an indelible mark on me. Following my mother's abandonment and moved to live with her new husband and kids, I found myself living with my aunt. My father didn't care for me as well and I would only see child support to my aunt. That Christmas Eve, my aunt asked if I could spend the night home alone so that they could celebrate with her boyfriend and his family. Despite feeling powerless to demand anything given my circumstances, I agreed to her request, grateful for the roof over my head. My aunt's house was located right beside a forest preserve surrounded by lush greenery and far from the hustle and bustle of the city. We had always felt safe and secure in this peaceful abode, until that night when something strange occurred. When Aunt Selena was away, I was sitting in the living room watching my favorite cartoon program on the television. Suddenly, I heard a loud noise that seemed to be coming from the front door. I quickly turned to check the clock, which read 11.45 p.m. I knew for sure that my aunt wouldn't be back tonight, and even if she did, she had a spare key with her. It was highly unlikely that anyone else would drop by at such an odd hour. The sound was making me increasingly anxious and frightened, and I couldn't shake off the unnerving feeling. As I stood frozen in the hallway, I called out to my aunt, hoping that she was the one standing on the other side of the door. Unfortunately, no one responded, and the eerie silence made my heart beat faster. I was too scared to move, so I thought turning up the volume of the TV would help me drown out the pounding of my heart. However, I could barely concentrate on the program I was watching, as my mind was fixated on the strange present lurking outside the door. Unlike most children my age who would have thought it was Santa or his elves with a present, I knew better. Santa wasn't real, and the idea of a stranger pretending to be him terrified me beyond measure. I couldn't shake off the feeling that whoever was standing outside the door was up to no good. As I returned to sit on the couch, I tried my best to focus on the program I was watching, when suddenly, there was a loud noise that sounded like thud, thud, coming from the front door. I froze in fear, my heart racing as I tried to convince myself that it was just a simple knock, but I knew it wasn't, because we had a doorbell that people usually use to announce their arrival. In a trembling voice, I managed to ask, who, who is it? There was no response, just silence. After a few seconds, another knock echoed through the house, sending shivers down my spine. This time, I didn't have the courage to ask who it was. I remained silent, hoping that whoever was at the door would go away. But then, I heard a faint whisper that made my blood run cold. Hey kid, open the door. It was the voice of an old woman but it was low and chilly, sending shivers down my spine. I felt like I was in a horror movie. I didn't reply. Instead, I covered my mouth with my palms of my hands, trying to stifle my breath so that whoever it was couldn't hear me. The voice whispered again, Open the door, kid. I have a present for you. This time, it sounded more eager and impatient than before. I knew that I had to be careful. I didn't know who was outside or what they wanted. I sat still, waiting for the person to leave, hoping that they would leave me alone. The sound of the knocking grew louder and more forceful, reverberating throughout the house and causing the door to shake with each impact. My heart raced with fear, and I couldn't shake the feeling that whoever was on the other side meant me harm. Despite my terror, I was paralyzed with indecision, unable to even consider calling 911 for help. Instead, I curled up on the couch, desperately trying to hide myself from the pounding at the door and the whispering threats of the mysterious stranger outside. As the night wore on, tears streamed down my face unwillingly as I desperately clutched the blanket around me for comfort. 
The knocking never ceased, a constant reminder of the danger lurking just outside. Exhausted, I eventually cried myself to sleep, only to be jolted awake by someone shaking me. Blinking away the grogginess, I saw Aunt Selina standing over me, her concerned gaze fixed on my disheveled form as she was asking me if I slept on the couch the entire night. With a trembling voice, I began bawling my eyes out and recounted to her the details of the previous night's events, and she reassured me that she would look into it. More terrifying was the fact that when she checked the CCTV footage outside the house to see if there was anyone there that night, there was no one. The footage showed an empty seat with no signs of anyone walking by her house, let alone standing outside the front door. The memory of that unsettling incident plagued my dreams for years to come. The image of that mysterious woman, whispering from beyond the closed door, beckoning me to open it, was etched into my mind. Nevertheless, I was grateful that I never had to experience that horror again. This was absurd. I could not believe another corpse was gone. I went to check up on newly arrived dead bodies and when I reached there, there were only six of them while I was informed that seven dead bodies were brought up from an accident site. It was the fourth one this month that I got missing from the hospital morgue and I couldn't believe even more that they were not raising the security. I mean yes, I understand that these people were already dead but if the corpses are getting stolen then the least they could do is raise security. Anyways, after confirming that there were seven bodies brought in, I went directly to the mortician who was in charge of the morgue, Jeremy Henry. People mostly called him Henry, and he was the nicest, kindest person I'd ever met. Okay, so I was telling you that I went to him, and I told him about another corpse being missing. He looked concerned as I told him this and said, This is going to damage the reputation of our hospital. Do we know the identity of the body? No. Do you realize that the only bodies that ever go missing every single time are the ones that have two things in common? They freshly died and they are unidentified. I told him and then he nodded his head. One thing that I was sure of is that I haven't even mentioned in front of Henry and that was that the culprit was someone who was working in the hospital. There was another thing that I was sure of which was that Henry was also suspecting it and that it must be someone in a higher position or at least someone who knew everything related to the dead bodies and the morgue. I went back to the morgue after the autopsies of the six dead bodies that were done and cleaned up in place. The only thing on my mind was curiosity about those missing bodies and it wasn't like they got up and walked down on their own. I could do it. I could also act as if nothing had happened and ignore the fact that someone was stealing bodies from the morgue. But I felt like it was disrespecting towards the dead. So I decided to start looking out for anyone who seemed suspicious. Two days passed and it was a day when the director of the hospital was to arrive to ask the employees if they were facing any issues and then address them. It was the perfect opportunity to bring this matter to light. So when he asked us if we were facing any sort of issue, I raised my hand. He told me to speak freely about whatever was on my mind and so I started telling him about the missing bodies from the morgue. Even though he told me the mortician took care of it, I could see him furrowing his eyebrows which felt a little odd to me, but again, not many hospitals care about dead bodies. I've seen such morgues who don't even treat the bodies nicely. The next day, another dead body of a guy was brought in. The boy was said to have hung himself and committed suicide. He was an orphan, so the hospital was instructed to arrange the burial of the body by itself. Something in me was saying that this corpse would also get stolen so I decided to guard it by not leaving the morgue no matter what. As I was trying to guard the morgue, hours had passed and I had taken a single break, so I started feeling tired and sleepy. I did not know when I dozed off, but as I was dozing off, I heard footsteps, so I slightly opened my eyes half asleep only to see that it was Henry. He was with another male nurse. He looked in my direction and I pretended to be asleep. As I closed my eyes, I could hear footsteps and noises I could tell that they were trying to be sneaky and that they would have been successful if I was asleep. But I wasn't and I could hear everything. I opened my eyes five minutes after I felt complete silence and immediately went back to check the cabin 
in which the boy's body was put. It was exactly what I had expected. The body was gone, and the person I trusted the most, thinking that he would never do such a thing, was the culprit behind all this. Still, I decided to go along with the act and rented his cabin, looking all worried, and told him that the body was missing. His concerned act was pretty convincing if I didn't know any better. I looked at him in a daze as he was asking, but then all of a sudden, he stopped playing the act and looked at me with a very serious look as if he was trying to figure something out. He told me to go to the morgue and then that he'll be there in a few minutes. So I walked out of his office. After a few steps, I decided to turn back around and check again because I didn't understand his reaction from earlier. So I walked back to him and sneakily hid behind the door as he seemed to be on a phone call with someone. Yes, I sent the body about the girl. I think she's on to something. Yes, I know that you told me to take care of her that day, but I was just giving her another chance. No, don't worry anymore. I'll take care of her tonight when there would be no one around. As I was listening to this conversation, my heart started to drop. I could tell that he was talking about killing me tonight, so I decided to get away from this hospital as fast as I could. I decided to run towards my cabin and grab my stuff, and after that I sneaked around to see if anyone was there. When I noticed that the path was clear, I quietly walked out of the hospital. At first I decided to go to the police directly, but then I remembered that I did not have any proof against them. So I called the cab and headed to my apartment. And as I was looking out from the window of the cab, I couldn't stop to think about Jeremiah Henry. He looked so nice and sweet, and acted all kind, but he was just a snake wearing an angel's skin to fool the people around him. I started working from an early age since I needed some money for my allowance and as time went by spending my own money while not asking my parents for a single penny started to feel good. You know how it is. When you start earning your own money, you can spend it however without someone else being in charge of it. There's also a matter of pride that doesn't allow you to take money from someone else once you start making it by working hard. I did all kinds of part-time work, working in the field, doing volunteer work, working as a delivery guy, and even pet sitting. All of those jobs had something to teach me, along with the experience and the pay. But on one job, I saw a nasty side and learned something about one of my coworkers. This is about the time when I started working at a grocery store. It had been almost six months since I started working there, and since the pay was quite good, I wasn't planning on leaving the job anytime soon unless the employer relieved me from my position on their own accord. Around that time, I briefly had a coworker named Matt. From the day he was hired, I took an instant dislike to him, looking at how loud he was when I first met him. These things rarely occur to me, but whenever it does, my instinct about the other person always turns out to be right. That following day when I went to the break room, he was talking unusually loud over the phone to someone that I could hear this entire conversation. It was about him losing money over some bet, and even after he saw me, he didn't stop his conversation and continue talking in the same manner to the other person online. In the end, I didn't get to use the break room and went back to my work. I didn't take any break that day since I was careful not to listen to any more of his annoying phone call conversations. The next day during work, he got a call from someone that had picked up and started arguing loudly. The people at the grocery store started looking at him, but judging by his reaction, he didn't seem to care about others listening to his conversation. That was when the manager of the store came and strictly told him that personal phone calls are not allowed in the break room and that also only during break time. Since he was still new, he was only given a warning. Had anyone else done it, they would have gotten an earful from him, including a pay cut since it disturbs the customers. After that day, I couldn't help but notice his gross habits, which made not only me, but other employees feel disgusted as well. He would grossly wipe his booger all over the place while working. And not only that, he kept chewing something loudly the entire day with his mouth open. That was not all. Slowly, he started arguing with other employees with little matters all the time and started picking fights on his own. We all started to avoid him as we all figured it was better this way if we didn't want to keep entangled with his nasty temper. Then one day, when I was going to the employee restroom, I saw him coming out. 
and just warning me not to go in there. When I asked for the reason, he simply just said that there was flooding without telling me why. As I took a look, I noticed the signs of a hot pocket that he tried to flush down the toilet, but since it didn't play out so well, there ended up being a blockage. I angrily stomped over to the manager and told him what he had done. He did get a long scolding, but surprisingly he didn't get fired over that. There was a temporary end to the closest employee restroom which was super annoying since the other one was on the other side of the store. All of us were tired and fed up with his annoying habits which were causing problems, but there was nothing we could do about it. A few days passed since the restroom issue and that day we were all focused on our work as there was a rush in the store. When a woman around her 60s walked in the store and started shopping, I did notice Matt who was on the counter duty that day giving a weird look to her. At first, I thought it must be nothing and didn't pay much attention to it. But then the lady went to the counter to get her items rung up and the annoyance on his face while looking at her was clear. I walked there sensing some possible trouble when I heard the lady asking if he was Matt, but he didn't give her a response, so she stayed quiet. As he was ringing the item, she told him that she did not need a bag and brought one of her own, but he ignored her and added the grocery bag on her list. The woman started saying that she didn't need it, but then all of a sudden he got angry and threw a whole sack of potatoes at her. By the time we could prevent it from happening, it was too late. The woman got pretty seriously injured and started bleeding. We immediately called for an ambulance and sent her to the emergency room to get treatment. When she was in the condition to speak, we asked how she knew him. And then she told us that she used to be his high school teacher and he was a bully all the time. By the time we got back, Matt was fired and talking to the cops. He didn't open his mouth as to why he did what he did. Instead, he attacked his own assigned lawyer as well. We never know why he did what he did, but one thing was decided. He sure had a nasty personality looking at how always he used to shout at his girlfriend as well over the phone. Over the years, I had all kinds of co-workers, jealous ones, those who are just nice from the outside, but hate you deeply from the inside, those whom are nice and those who always betray you for your gain. But someone like Matt was the first one I had encountered, and I hope it stays that way because I don't think I'm ready to deal with another Matt ever in my lifetime. Adjusting to a new job is always hard, but it becomes even harder when your senior is a jerk who makes you do even his share of work in the name of training. I had a similar experience when I landed a temporary job at a reputed magazine company. I was overjoyed and thrilled when I saw the email about getting hired. I had decided that I was going to work so hard and get recognized. Doesn't matter even if I have to work to my bone since I wanted to be an editor. But unfortunately, I didn't get to fulfill my dream and had to leave soon due to an issue with one of my seniors who was in charge of training me. It was the first day on the job. I got up early, and after freshening up, I put on the already selected suit while humming happily. After I was done getting ready, I walked out of my apartment, locked it, and walked almost as if I was skipping to the parking lot. I decided to take the car that my father had gifted me after my graduation to make a good impression on the first day of my job. That was why I had already cleaned it a little a day before this. I had always been a confident person, doesn't matter where I stood, whether it was a school, college, or one of those family meetings where Aunt Agatha makes the rules. I never hesitated even once to state my opinion on the matter, since I had always been encouraged for that by my parents, and because of that my confidence level only grew over time. So when I was pushed out by the crowd while exiting the elevator which caused me to fall and bruise my knees, I immediately stood up, brushed the dirt off, and walked to the manager's office with the confidence intact. Who? The man sitting on the seat buried in papers raised his head as he saw me knock on the already open door, whom I presumed to be the manager. It's Tristan Swan. I was hired for the temp position and today's my first day, I said with a big smile on my face. Oh yes, I did receive your resume. You can go to the HR office, the fifth one on the left side, and can get your access card. They'll tell you to whom to report after that. He said burying his head again in those papers, and so I bowed my head a little before going to the HR. After I was done with all the joining formalities, I was told to meet the assistant team leader, Morgan, 
for the fashion department and that he would be giving me this week's training. So I did as I was told and met up with the man who looked in his early 40s, half bald, grumpy looking. And the moment we met, he sent me on a coffee run saying it was the first step of the training. I had seen this in movies and TV shows, but I never expected them to do this in real life as well. After the coffee, he gave me work like organizing everyone's desks, including his own, which was the messiest one, and it took me more than an hour to figure out what documents to put where. The day went just like that, and finally it was time to leave, when Morgan called me to tell me that I needed some work to do before heading out. I waited for him when he put a pile of documents on my desk and asked me to read them. I looked at him dumbfounded without blinking, but sir, it could take hours and this is my first day," I said hesitantly. So? You're an employee now, so you'll be working overtime if needed. Now, read this, write a review, report according to these papers, and put it on the team leader's desk before leaving," he said in a careless voice as he walked out on the floor. A few other people were working there too, but they all left slowly. Since I was determined to work hard, as I mentioned earlier, I continued reading and writing honest reviews about the products accordingly. I was finished with the work assigned after four hours and then headed back home. The tiredness I was feeling was something like I had done labor work the entire day, so I fell asleep as soon as I went to bed. The next morning when I woke up, I realized that I didn't even have dinner last night, so the first thing I did was make breakfast. After that, I took a warm shower and then got ready for the second day of work. When I got there, I saw Morgan getting stolen by team leader Eric. He was holding the review paper that I had on his desk and I heard him saying, You're not a newbie to make such a kind of mistake. You know very well that the review writing style of our team is entirely different from others. So how in the world can you make such a critical mistake to such an important matter? We have so much more to do in so little time. Now I have to correct all your mistakes myself. At least do the work you're assigned properly. Excuse me, sir. I was the one who wrote that. As I said that, both their heads turned in my direction. Unbelievable! You made a newbie handle such an important task? It hasn't even been a week for her yet. Train her properly first before doing something like this. He got even angrier and then stomped out after scolding him. What do you think you were doing jumping in like that? Morgan turned to me said while gritting his teeth. But sir, I said that because I didn't want you to take the blame for my mistake in that review, I said hesitantly. Who told you to butt in? He said a little louder in an angrier voice. But sir, I just... No, don't speak unless spoken to. Understand that. And he shouted those words while cutting me off mid-sentence. I just looked at him surprised. I couldn't even get a word out if I wanted to. After that, he told me to follow him to his office with the review in hand while muttering, you called that review report. And as soon as we reached his office, he started scolding me for about an hour, venting his frustration of getting scolded by the TL on me. I'd be lying if I said I didn't feel like I'd be starting to shed tears, or I would start shouting at him if he said another word in that tone. But I simply stood there listening to his nonsense. It wasn't my fault all of this was happening. He was the one who gave a total newbie such an important job to finish just so he could relax. He didn't even give me an hour's worth of training to understand what their company rules were all about, and he expected me to perfect something I had little knowledge of. What was pissing me off even more was that he dared to treat me like it was my work in the first place when it was his to do all along. He didn't stop on that and continued screaming at me, but one could take only so much. So I walked out and made my way directly to the manager's office. After telling the manager everything and saying that I cannot work in such an environment, I walked out again. After exiting the building, I took a deep sigh. I looked up at the cloudy sky and it seemed like it was about to rain. It was the first blow in my confidence. I never guessed what the outside world could look like on my own since I always had the support of my parents. I slowly walked to my car with weak legs, and that was the end of my first new job on its second day. This incident happened when I was visiting West Bengal, which is a state in one of the South Asian countries, India. Being new to this place and English being my first language, I couldn't understand what most of the folks there were saying, and nor were they able to understand me. 
There were a few young people who knew how to speak English, but my southern accent was not that much of a help. So when I was talking to this young guy, I don't know what part of my speech or accent went wrong on his ears while asking about the most flaunted regions of the state, but he looked a bit shocked as if he wasn't expecting that from me. I remembered being in Darjeeling at the time, which was a beauty all on its own. Despite being a guy who travels to a lot of different countries, I had never seen such a breathtaking scenery before. I don't mean to offend anybody, each country has its uniqueness, but those who have been there before would be able to understand what I'm trying to say here. Anyway, when the guy gave me directions of what seemed to be a hill situation, I figured he may have misgotten what I had asked him. Instead of taking me a taxi or any other mode of transportation, I decided to hike to the place. I was confident that I'd be able to withstand the journey. It took me about 8 hours to reach there. And when I did, I was met with a young-looking guy wearing a white shirt and gray pants. He introduced himself as Raj, and asked me if I needed a guy since he was one. After walking straight for 7 hours and 45 minutes, my confidence had taken a bit of a toll, so I decided to give him a chance and accepted him as my guide. There were a few problems with understanding his pure Indian accent, but he seemed fluent in the language itself so it was better to have someone like him alongside me if I needed to engage in a conversation with another Indian. I was thirsty and hungry. He also started to take me over my senses, so I told him that he would move forward after I quenched my thirst and fill my belly. He nodded in response and went off to somewhere where I took a nice spot to eat whatever I had bought up. I took out potato stuffed thick tortillas that I had bought earlier and started eating them felt too spicy for my taste, but I still loved the combination of flavors mixed in this. I took out one of the bottled waters and emptied its content in my stomach. When I was done eating, I rested a bit before walking any further. About a half hour later, Raj came back and asked if I wanted to look around. I was still tired, but since I didn't want to waste the young boy's time any more than I had, I got up and started following. He started walking me into the woods and telling me about many historic things about the place that I found quite interesting. As we were walking further, I couldn't help but take notice that I hadn't seen a single soul beside this guy ever since I stepped foot there, so I asked him why there weren't people around the area. It's because they're scared to come this time around. I felt the wind being weird as he said that, along with his pace getting slower, but thinking it was just my imagination, I asked him, what's so scary? There wasn't any response from Raj's side, even his footsteps had disappeared, which only gave my heart a sinking thump along with a tightness in my chest. I didn't dare turn around, but I had to in case I was wrong, so I hesitantly turned, only to see there was no one there, and Raj had suddenly disappeared into thin air. The woods were pitch black, and the only thing I had was my phone's flashlight since Raj was the one carrying essential stuff started calling out his name while saying that if it was some kind of prank, it wasn't the slightest bit funny. But there was no response. Not knowing what to do and where I was, I started to run in whatever direction when I felt someone following me. Thinking it must be Raj, I turned around, only to find an old woman in Indian attire. I thought she must be one of the locals and might know which direction leads out of the woods, so I started asking her questions. I tried to speak as slowly as possible for her to understand me, but when she said in response shook me even more since I knew for a fact that the language she spoke was neither Hindi nor this state's local, because I have heard many of those languages and I haven't heard a single person speaking in the dialect she used. She then gave me a blood-curdling smile which terrified me to my core, and I started running in the opposite direction of her. Luckily, I was able to run out of the woods and stumble across the same guy who told me about Dow Hill this morning. But as I was too spooked to be able to speak a word, he went ahead and started speaking in his slow Indian accent. Even though I told you about this place since you asked me about a haunted area, but I couldn't sleep worrying about you, so I came. This isn't the kind of haunted place you could come to like this. I was too scared to correct him that I never asked for a haunted one in the first place, and this was all because of a simple misunderstanding. But still, I silently followed him. He had brought a taxi with him, which was parked in a distance. He then took me to his home as a guest, and insisted that I stay the night. 
His family was too nice. They offered me multiple different dishes to each, and each one had an entirely different flavor. Even though I had a little spooky experience, the love this family showed me weighed more. Arav, you know about the guides who work here? I asked the next morning as I was exiting his house. Yeah, a few of my friends work there, so I know almost everyone, he said with a cheerful smile. One of the guides whom I met yesterday disappeared all of a sudden. His name was Raj. I gave him the description of what he looked like, but he looked at me with the same expression he gave the other day I met him and said, I don't believe someone like that works there. I'd have to ask my friend if he is someone. I'm Marionette, and I'm from a small little town surrounded by beautiful scenery. It's like a hidden gem that no one knows about. But despite the beauty of the town, there's no possible growth for an individual there. So if someone was determined to become successful or even earn a decent sum of money, he or she had to drive for about more or less 40 minutes from the town to the city for a job. People there were unfamiliar with the town's name, so we decided to keep it that way by not telling them until it was necessary. But I was not looking for actual growth when I was hunting for a job. It was more like out of necessity, since I had recently become an orphan after my father's death by accident, who was my only remaining guardian left after my mom abandoned us. Anyway, I was too scared to go work in the city, since I had heard many stories from the town folks who had worked there about its dangers, so I found a job in a supermarket that was on the outskirts of the city. It seemed like it had a great reputation, since the pay they were offering was a lot higher than what I was offered within the town, so I took the job. Surprisingly enough, even the store that was closest to the town had never heard of its existence, and when I put my address on the employee form, they looked at me as if I was someone who had come from an entirely different planet. On my first day, there weren't many customers, so besides basic work, there was nothing more to do. But on my second day, there was a huge rush, so I was busy all day. My job was mostly cleaning and organizing stuff, and when I was done, I would help out the counter. Everything seemed pretty easy, and even the other two part-timers who worked there besides me seemed nice enough, even though they did not talk much. After working for a week, I understood the daily routine of the store. The store used to open at sharp 6 in the morning, and all the employees had to reach 5 minutes before its opening. Right after the store opening, I would have to do the cleaning of the entire store in the area surrounding the store within half an hour. The next thing I had to do after cleaning was check all the product and their expiry date, throwing the expired item to the room that was in the back side of the store. After I was done with that, I would have to change all the meats and the fresh ones that were delivered each day while giving them the old meat. Doesn't matter if it was just a day old, even though the meat was frozen. There were some other rules like that which were a bit weird for me to understand, like what would happen if I came a second late to the store? But since I didn't want to lose my job, and I did not know what they might do if I arrived late, I always reached 15 minutes before the assigned time, and waited for others in the meantime. There were also questions about why replace the meat every single day if they were bought in fresh, and most importantly, what did they do with the unsold meat? There was another strange thing about this store. And it was that even though I cleaned the store from corner to corner, the next day, even the walls would look like they had never been cleaned. It was my first time experiencing things like that, but since the stories I had heard from the city were far worse than one could imagine, I thought maybe it might be common in the city as well. On the day of my interview, I was told to do my job silently without ever asking any questions. I couldn't even escape from my own curiosity. Even if I wanted to ask questions of my coworkers, they always ignored each other, so I didn't think there was any hope for a new employee like me. It was the ninth day of my job when I reached early as always and waited for the store to open. The part-timer who used to open the store came in a bit late that day, so the store opening was delayed just by five minutes. She was also new just like me, so it might be she just did that intentionally to see what would happen if we opened the store slightly later than the given time. Anyway, we got in, and just like all the other days, I cleaned the store in half an hour as per routine, and by the time the guy who used to bring in the meat came by, the work wasn't done, so I asked him to wait for five minutes. He looked frustrated when I asked him that, but he didn't say anything. So after I was finished with work, I went to take the meat out to hand them to him. Believe me when I tell you that I saw the state of the meat, I couldn't believe that nobody had gotten sick from eating this product from the store. 
The smell that was coming from the meat was unbearable as it had gotten stale by that time. I didn't have to think about the scary stories of the city to know what this store owner was doing something extremely detrimental to the consumers since it could make them severely sick. I knew how to report the store to the health inspector since I'd seen it online when I was looking for a few things, and so I immediately did that without thinking. When I called them and gave them the store's address, something shocking happened. The man on the call told me the address I was giving him didn't exist. I was confused by what he was saying, so I repeated myself. But after saying the same thing a third time to me, he thought maybe someone might be pulling a prank on him, so he disconnected the call. That was when I heard the store shutter closing, so I went to see what was going on. That was when I saw the meat guy and the manager were standing there, and the other part-timer who opened the store late was lying dead on the floor. The meat guy had a big knife in his hand, and he was looking at me like a predator would look at its prey. This store is just like your unknown town, hidden from the eyes of others, but still famous enough to earn me good money. So why are you people to determine to ruin that for me? The manager's voice felt so evil that he said that tilting his head. My breath felt like it got stuck in my throat, and my brain started to get foggy, unable to understand what to do next. That was when I remembered the room in the back of the store. There was an exit door there, so I ran toward it. Not again. Chasing is something that I hate the most. Brian, you chase and make sure to kill her if you want to live. I heard the store manager's voice behind me. The good thing was that I was an expert in hiding and escaping ever since I was a child so I ran as a rabbit and somehow managed to get out of the store. But even then, I could feel the Brian guy chasing after me, so I kept running until I reached the town's border, and once I crossed it, I was so tired that my legs felt numb. I stopped for a brief moment and turned to see if he was still chasing me, but he had disappeared, as if he had never been there. I was still not sure to trust that, so I kept running until I reached the first house, where I knew I would be safe. My vision started to get blurry. As I was passing out, one question kept repeating itself in my mind. What did he mean by unknown town? Hey Anthony, what are you doing this Saturday? Carlos asked me when I walked into the cafeteria. Nothing, just planning on playing games all weekend. Why are you asking? I said while moving ahead to get the food while he continued following me. Well, I was thinking you should come over to my house for a sleepover. He said while grabbing two sandwiches from the counter. Sure, but what about your parents? You remember they don't like me very much, right? I asked as we walked towards an empty table with our meals. Don't worry about them. It will be out all weekend. So you can come over and they'll never know. After saying that he left, I continued eating my food before the lunch break was over. Carlos and I have been friends since the day he moved into this town. It's been like, what, seven years or something since we first met? About his parents, I don't know why they don't like me, but they always keep asking him to stay away from me. Saying I'm some bad influence or something. I mean, come on, they don't know their son one bit because if someone is a bad influence, it's him. He does everything. He drinks and smokes, and even when he's not of legal age to be smoking or drinking, and dates like crazy. I mean, he changes girlfriends every week, and I'm the one who keeps asking him to stop doing all this stuff. Now, you be the judge and tell me who's a bad influence over here. But for my parents, he's a saint who has just dropped on his earth from heaven. Seriously, guys. What is up with these parents not trusting me, even though I never do any of the stuff that he does? But still, I love the dude. He's a good friend. Anyway, I went to class after lunch was done, and as always, Carlos was skipping the math class. I shrugged my shoulders, went to my seat, and attended the lecture with complete focus. After school was over, I saw him walking to my house. He was walking with some girl, and as soon as he saw me, he waved his hand over to me. After saying something to them, he came to me and started walking with me. So you're out for the sleepover plan, right? He asked. Yes, but you sure that there won't be any girls there? I asked while rolling my eyes, and in response he started laughing. I wish there could be, but no man. 
It's going to be just us. He told me as he stopped laughing. Fine then, I'll ask my parents and I'll text you about it. I said and he stopped near the fence of his house and said goodbye to me before going inside. He lived a few blocks away from me so I continued walking until I reached my house. My mom was in her office at this time as usual and my dad was out at the workstation that he had built in his house. So I decided to wait till dinner to ask him about the sleepover. Even though I already knew what their answer was going to be, I had to ask still. Anyway, mom came around 7 p.m. and after freshening up, she went to the kitchen to check if dad had cooked anything. But as usual, there was nothing. So she quickly started making pasta and asked me to call dad over, which I did. And after a brief heated argument about why dad can't cook for once, knowing that she might be late and tired too, the dinner was served. I casually asked him about the sleepover while we were having dinner. And do you guys want to know what their first response was? It was, you know, his parents don't like you, right? I told them that was out of the question and my parents agreed for me to stay over at his place while saying that I should learn something from him since he was such a good guy. I rolled my eyes and finished eating my food. The next evening, I went over to Carlos's place around 6 or 7 p.m. He had brought some beers for us to drink, I refused to drink, but he still insisted that I should give them a try, so I agreed. After about a can each, we started playing some games. It was fun having a sleepover once in a while. We played Call of Duty, FIFA, and some other games till late at night. When we were done playing video games, we went over to Carlos's bedroom and started talking. Our conversation went from funny to deep, and then emotional and sad to funny again. We continued talking for hours and did not even notice when we fell asleep. I woke up in the middle of the night feeling thirsty, so I walked downstairs to the kitchen just to get some water. After drinking water, I realized that I had to pee as well. So I started looking for a washroom, and since it was my first time in his house, I did not know where things were. I roamed around for a while looking for them. I had no idea that his house was this huge. There were so many rooms, most of them were locked, and that was when I heard some weird noises coming from one of them. I thought about Carlos telling me that there was no one else besides him there. So I started thinking that it might be a thief or something. I tried opening the door, but it was locked. The noise was still continuously coming from there, so I tried to hear it by putting my ears on the door, and it felt like a muffling sound, as if someone was trying to say something but was unable to. That was when a badly curled up paper got slipped from inside the room. I picked it up, and as I was about to open it up, Carlos called me looking all worried from three rooms away. What are you doing here? No one is supposed to come here, and if surveillance finds out, and my parents, then they're going to kill me. He said in a worried and nervous voice. I was looking for a bathroom dude, but your place is so huge that I got lost. I said while putting the paper in my back pocket. Carlos showed me the bathroom that was near his room, and after that we both slept. The next day he made us breakfast and I forgot to tell him about the noises I heard the last night because I did not think much of it at the time. After reaching home, I remembered about putting the paper in my back pocket, so I took it out and unfolded it. As I read it, I felt goosebumps because it said, Help! I'm locked up in here. Have you ever lied on your resume about anything? Education, experience, anything. If you have, then you would know that the thoughts that crossed your mind at the times are similar to, no one will ever find out about this anyway. It's not like they're gonna check the authenticity of my resume or what harm a little lie about my experience could do. I also did the same thing once in the past, but I had learned my lesson since the lie wasn't worth the humiliation I went through because of that. That lie was as small as an ant, and I never imagined it could cause me so much damage. Well, technically, I did not lie on my resume. I just simply hid a fact related to my work history. That was when I was job hunting. I would grab whatever opportunity I could get, which resulted in me getting a job in a travel company that later turned out to be a fraud. They were scamming people by taking their money and having no clue about it. I worked with them for almost two months. It was when the employees suddenly got arrested after the company fled, and we had to serve some time in jail on their behalf. None of it was our fault, so they let us go after a few days. 
This was the only information I hid from people when I started job hunting again, and it wasn't so wrong to do so. Anyone in my shoes would have done the same. As I was applying non-stop for job openings, I continued doing my research on those companies since, you know, burn me once, shame on you, burn me twice, shame on me. That was about the time when I got an interview email from a well-known company. I went for the interview rounds at the scheduled time and cracked all three rounds, successfully getting hired for the position. The person who took the last round was in some higher level position, which I don't clearly remember at the moment. He seemed impressed by my responses to each question and the ideas I presented, but unfortunately I never got to meet him after that. I had to report to the manager after the first few days and learned about the company and its rules and policies. After the training period was over, we were all assigned work and targets that we had to complete daily. I suppose it would be rude to say I was doing excellent on my job compared to others, but I had achieved my targets for 15 days straight, earning praise from all the seniors and even the manager. Just like that, more than three months passed by, and one day as we were working, all of our PCs shut down all of a sudden due to some unknown issue. They called the IT department through the landline, and after a few minutes, a guy walked in to fix the system. He looked familiar for some reason, but I just couldn't quite put my finger on it. As he was sitting on the main computer, which was the manager's, I noticed him being sneaky and carefully installing some software in there. That was when I remembered where I'd seen him before. He worked with that fraud company, and in fact, he was one of the main figures there. By the looks of it, he didn't seem to recognize, which I could use to my advantage, so I asked other employees who had been working for quite some time in this company about the guy, and guess what they told me? They said he's new here. He had joined the company a few days ago, but since he is so good with computers, they already let him work. I immediately rushed to the manager and informed him that the guy is involved in some serious fraud and had run a scam company earlier without mentioning my involvement in it. They caught him and hold him in the other offices before calling the police. Unfortunately for me, the officer that came in knew me. He was the one who helped me prove my innocence in the case. So you finally caught the culprit, huh? The moment he said that, everyone started to look at me like I was involved in this case as well. He analyzed the situation and added, don't worry guys, she was a victim too. He thought he had helped me by that looking at the way he winked at me like we were some kind of buddies, but I knew it was gonna blow up in my face. They took the guy and investigated the computers. It seemed like he was trying to install some kind of hacking software, but due to my quick action, he was unsuccessful in doing so. And not only that, but he used fake information about himself as well. The manager called me into his office and asked me about it. There was no point in hiding it anymore, so I came clean and told him everything. At the time, he said everything would be fine since I was an excellent employee, but I knew very well how these incidents could bring drastic changes in the environment. Within a few days, there were rumors about me all over the place. Not about how I protected the company from almost getting hacked and losing its billions worth of personal data. Instead, it was about people suspecting my involvement in that. Trust me, not a single person thanked me or expressed their gratitude toward me. After all, it was thanks to my unfortunate experience that I recognized the culprit in an instant, but all these people were tormenting and humiliating me. A conference meeting was called to resolve the issue, which they thought was affecting the reputation. Having an employee who might be a criminal since she had been convicted in the past for something she wasn't even guilty of. I was specially summoned to the meeting, where I repeated my story again and again about how I was a victim myself, and many other employees had become scapegoats for those people's crimes. But they kept dismissing me by saying, why didn't I tell them about this before? Why hide or lie about something I was innocent of? After publicly humiliating me, they fired me, saying they couldn't risk any danger by letting me stay in the company. I know there must be many people working there who had been victims of job fraud just like me, but not a single one stood up for me. The thing was about this entire situation that I had learned my lesson. Yes, it was also about not lying in my resume or hiding anything, but mostly it was about what I was going to do next. I wasn't going to work under someone else ever again. I knew I was going to become successful on my own and be my own boss. I was in ninth grade when I first found the Zoltar Speaks in an arcade. I went with my friend Chad. It was a classic animatronic fortune telling machine. There were fortune telling cookies that I knew about, but I had never seen something like this in my life. 
Even though I knew it was fake and there wasn't such a thing as predicting someone's future, I still inserted the coin in the slot. The guy inside the machine moved his hand over the crystal ball in front of him, and a robotic voice said, Hear your future from Zoltar. Ah, it looks like today would be your lucky day, for I see you finding something you long for. A ticket was printed out telling the fortune that I would find something, while the guy inside the machine said something along the lines of, Come again if you want to know your future. I put the ticket in my back pocket, laughing about these things being fake, and went back to playing other games in the arcade. After about an hour or two of playing, I went back home with Chad, who lived just across the street from me. The very same evening when I was watching a cartoon with my little sister Mia in the living room, Father surprises us with his sudden return from the business trip he had gone to, and originally should be arriving three days later. With the happiness from this, Mom made a special dinner for all of us, which was amazing since she usually made us eat healthy things such as green vegetables for our meals. I was the kind of kid who was picky to a fault and always made all kinds of faces during meals, but that dinner I ate gladly without causing a commotion for the first time since there was nothing green about this food. Um, son, I had brought something for you. As I was leaving my room for dinner, father called me. My eyes opened widely in exhalation when I saw the box he was holding. He had brought me that Minecraft game I was asking for months. I rushed to take it while saying thank you, along with giving him a cheery hug. Didn't you say we were short on money this month? We could have bought it some other time, I heard mom saying to father, as she took off his coat and hung it inside the wardrobe. The salesman's pitch was too good, I couldn't refuse it. Besides, I finally got my bonus this morning. I heard his voice walking out of the room. I still had the ticket in my back pocket from Zoltar, so I took it out and looked at it. Then I looked back to the box I was holding. It couldn't be. Did my fortune just come true? I thought in my mind. The next day I asked Chad to come to the same arcade with me. When the two of us reached there, I went to the spot where I saw the machine last time. But it was strange. The machine wasn't there anymore. Instead, there was some other game placed. I went to one of the employees and asked where they put it, and what they said was even weirder. What are you talking about, kid? We never had Zoltar in our arcade. I looked at Chad, who looked confused as to what was happening. When I asked him if he saw that machine the last time we came here together, he denied it, saying that he was playing games the whole time and didn't pay much attention to what I was doing. I went back home afterward, confused and a bit terrified, thinking what I met with could be a ghost machine. But that's not how the story ends. About 10 years later, I was at Chad's birthday party, which he had arranged as a costume one. Yes, the two of us remained friends even after all those years. He was wearing a pirate costume while I was in Zack Foster's costume. It's one of the anime characters, and those who have seen it probably would recognize him immediately. Anyway, so as we were talking about something, I noticed a man in Zoltar's costume. He approached and introduced himself as the character and didn't give us his real name. Thinking of him as one of the guests, we talked to him for a few minutes and moved on to greet others. But a few minutes later, he came back and asked to do a tarot card reading. Since I did not want to appear impolite, I let him do whatever he wanted. He gave us a creepy smile, which felt unnatural for some reason and then started with the character's famous line before saying something weird. This party is going to come to an end soon, and you would end up covered in something red. I won't deny that the way he said that felt harrowing, but I still laughed thinking he was just acting the part he was dressed as. But his expression changed at my response, and whispered something into my ear before walking away, which left me petrified. We all went toward the bar to enjoy a few drinks, but I don't know why I continued feeling uneasy and disturbed. I scanned the room to see if the man was still there, and his absence only made me more frantic. It is fun for you people, isn't it? My attention was drawn to the drunk woman whose eyes appeared to be red and swollen, probably from crying, and she sat on the chair next to mine. Huh? I looked around to see if she was talking to someone else, as her eyes were stuck on the filled glass in front of her. It isn't. Don't worry. I'll make fun for everyone. 
she turned her head toward me and said while looking straight into my confused eyes. I was still trying to make sense of her words, but then she pulled out a gun and blew her brains out. The sudden burst of blood splattered all over my face and clothes, making me unable to move from the state of panic I was stuck in from that. A great deal of terror washed all over my face, and I started screaming, which only got faint from mingling with others. My feelings got disoriented. I started shaking like a leaf, along with tears falling from my eyes. Police were called immediately. A few of them started taking care of the scene, and two of them proceeded with questioning the remaining guests, but looking at how I was having a panic attack, they said they'd question me when I felt better and moved on to questioning the others. Chad took me to a bathroom and helped me wash the blood off my face. As he was doing that, I could tell his face turning pale from thinking something. He then looked at me and said, I understand the part of the party ending early looking at his possible involvement in this, but how did that Zoltar man know you were going to get covered in blood? His words blanched my already terrified face. How did you like the Minecraft game, son? His whispering words started ringing in my ears as I stood there frozen, covered in the woman's blood, while Chad tried to wash it off. It was midnight, and I was still lying awake in my bed scrolling through my phone, chatting with Jackson who was just as sleepless at the time as I was. That was when I came across a website, 4chan. It was the first time I had seen this, but for some reason my curiosity was piqued, so I got in. I couldn't quite put my head around it. It seemed like some kind of anonymous chatting platform. As I was trying to make sense of the site and understand what it was all about, a picture with dark background suddenly popped open in front of my eyes. Upon looking at it, the picture seemed like it was some sign of a demonic cult. The black's X sign seemed to be carved out from wood and painted over, but the skull over it looked it was in the middle of red bones. The red liquor splatted across the sign looked definitely like blood, and not just that, the four blood lace nickels across the sign were giving off an unsettling eerie vibe as well. I couldn't look at the picture any longer, so I immediately closed the website and got off my phone. The next morning, I woke up with a weird throbbing pain in the back of my head that followed through the neck area to the shoulders, probably from waking up till late at night. Still, I got up, took a refreshing shower, and got ready to attend the morning lecture. Since I was in the last year of my college, I couldn't risk ditching any more classes than I already had. The rest of my day went busy as usual, looking at how I was doing an internship as well, so by the time I was free, it had already been past eight. That was when my phone started to ring. I looked over its screen to see it was Jackson calling, so I picked up. Dude, where are you? Judging by its voice, it was safe to say that he was driving. Around my company, why? I asked as I was walking toward the bus stop. Stay right where you are, I'm coming to pick you up. Before I could respond to this, he disconnected the call, so I followed his command and started waiting for him. About 15 minutes later, I saw his car coming in my direction and within the next two minutes, he was in front of me showing off his teeth. I got inside and he started driving, but the route he took didn't lead to my apartment. Don't tell me, you're taking me to a club, aren't you? I asked in frustration as he saw me taking the turn that led to the nightclub. Yep, and there's no way I'm letting you off, he said stopping the car in front of the club within a mere minute. The rest of the night seemed to blur as I only sat near the corner sipping whiskey without even trying to enjoy the madness around me, while Jackson on the other hand was dancing with a strange lady. I didn't care what he did, the only thing I did care was that I was tired and needed sleep. There was only so much I could endure and if he was going to dance with another lady for the night, I was going to ditch him and leave. I looked at my watch, it was past midnight now. I needed my sleep if I wanted to continue with my daily routine, and there was no way I was going to let my internship go because of this jackass. So I texted him that I was going home by taking a taxi or something else, and then exited the place. After several failed attempts to book a cab or find a taxi nearby, I decided to walk a little further to the taxi stand. You probably wouldn't believe me, but as I was walking toward the stand, I heard a goat scream sound coming from the nearby woods. 
I stopped on my track with a spooky feeling inside my chest and hesitantly turned my head toward the direction. The voice was still coming, but it was getting slower and then with pauses. It was as if the goat was struggling somewhere. The terrifying feeling that had overtaken my senses changed into a worried one by the thoughts that probably had gotten stuck in a hunter's trap or something and must be in pain. So without a second thought, I walked in the direction of the voice. But what I saw upon reaching was beyond my expectation. I stood terror-stricken beside a tree looking at the scene playing in front, which felt like it had come out of a horror movie. A group of people wearing black robes were standing around in a circle. A black goat that was on the verge of dying was laying inside it. And that was not all. A woman stripped naked to her clothes sitting right in front of the goat as calmly as the wind with a blindfold on her eyes. There was a huge sign planted on the ground which seemed familiar. That was when two women wearing the same robes as others stepped forward and walked toward the girl with that looked like the same sign as the big one. A piece of cloth was filled inside the naked woman's mouth and then one of the women put the sign on her forehead and the other one nailed it with a hammer. At this point, I stuffed my hand inside my mouth to stop my screams from coming out of my throat. I could tell the woman couldn't bear the pain and was about to run away, but a man grabbed her from behind, making her forcefully continue sitting in that position. The hammer was used three times, and as the fourth and last hammer was nailed to her forehead, she fell lifeless, and all those standing there started chanting something, while the two who killed her filled a bowl with her blood. I was shaking at this point, and tears had started to come rushing down my eyes. Unable to withstand watching the horror in front of my eyes, I ran outside those woods as fast as I could. I could feel them noticing their footsteps as I took off, but I didn't turn back and continued running only to stop in front of the bar again. That was when I bumped into Jackson, who was coming out of the bar all drunk. But as he looked at the state I was in, frightened, eyes all red and filled with tears, and my entire body sweating, like a horse as if I had just won a marathon, he came back to his senses and started asking me what happened. I didn't say anything, except, let's just go. He dropped me safely at my apartment, and without looking back, I ran inside, still scared, thinking they will find me. I spent almost two hours in the shower trying to remove the sweat along with the feverish feeling I was having, and I was getting to bed it came to my mind. Sign. I remember where I had seen it before. It was the same demonic cult sign I saw on 4chan the other night. You must be loving this, aren't you? Silva's tone sounded bitter. Why would I enjoy your downfall? It's not like I'm your enemy or something, Wayne said calmly as if whatever was going on didn't affect him. No wonder Silva was doubting him. Don't test my patience. I'm not in the mood for one of your little pranks, Silva, Wayne shouted in anger. I'm not pulling a prank. What you experienced was a sleep paralysis. Tell him, Carl. I just simply shrugged my shoulders in response, and Silva was still as calm as ever when he told him that but it was no use since he didn't believe him and continued screaming at him. I don't know what it was this time, but it wasn't something new for me to witness. Living with these two for almost a year now, I've come to terms with their arguments and disagreements on different matters. Wayne and Silva are brothers, but the way they keep arguing all the time, one could mistake them for their worst enemy, the kind of person who cannot stand each other. Their opposite personalities continue to crash all the time, to the point where I am sick and tired of it by now. Silva was a bit of the fun type, always stayed calm, kept cracking jokes, making fun of everything and everyone, and most importantly, he was famous for his twisted, weird, yet funny pranks on Silva. Wayne, on the other hand, was a bit cranky. Silva always said that he was the grumpy dwarf from the Snow White story. He always hated Silva's pranks and always opposed his opinion like it was the purpose of his existence to always argue with his brother. But still, there were times when it seemed like they were each other's brothers as they always got each other's backs without even saying anything to one another. And that was something about them that I admired. Today was supposedly a big day for me, 
since I got the news that I might get a promotion in the position I had been aiming for so long. I wanted to share this with my roommates and have a celebration with them. That was why, after just hearing the news when I was about to text them this, I controlled myself and went to my seat. I continued giving my full focus to my work and finished my share before time to leave early, but my boss gave me another task that took a bit longer, so I exited my workplace a bit later than my leaving time. I was still very excited to share the news of my possible promotion with those two idiots, so I rushed to the parking lot and even refused my coworker Sam to give him a ride and drove straight to the apartment. On the way, I bought beers and snacks for us to eat and put them on the back seat. I was going to tell them about our little drinking celebration after sharing the news, but the moment I stepped inside the apartment, I heard Wayne shouting at Silva in the living room. Thinking that it must be another disagreement over some matter, I slowly walked there and sat silently on the couch, started to watch their fight. Wayne was accusing his brother of pulling an extreme level of prank on him while he was sleeping, but Silva refused to accept that saying he didn't do such a thing, which was unlike him because no matter what kind of nasty prank he plays on someone, he always owns up to it rather proudly. What did he do? I finally asked after listening to their non-stop useless bickering. This is gonna be fun. Silva remarked as he noticed his brother's expression which seemed obvious that he was getting ready to tell me. This evening Silva made smoothies and gave me a drink. In about a half an hour of drinking that I fell asleep, just when I was slowly falling into a deep slumber, I suddenly felt a heavy object on my chest that made me feel suffocated. At first, I couldn't understand what it was, but then I saw him sitting on the chest and kept glaring at me without even saying. For some reason, I couldn't move my body, nor was I able to speak, no matter how hard I tried. I know I was saying his name, and even though my lips were moving, I just couldn't get the words out of my mouth, Wayne told me. And do you believe I did that? Silva said after hearing him. Who else has a face like you? And tell me, who else other than you would pull such a prank? Do you have any idea how frightened I was? I was feeling like I would die in my sleep. I even started to think that you planned all this just to kill me. My breath started to distort. I was feeling like my soul was getting sucked out of my body. That suffocation was unbearable. He replied in disappointment as if he believed his brother would do something like that. Silva's right. He didn't do anything of that sort. You're misunderstanding him and getting confused with your hallucinations. I said in a slow voice which made him look at me in disbelief. The moment I heard all of this, I knew it wasn't any kind of prank. I was well aware of these symptoms, since I used to have them in my teenage years. Are you seriously taking sides at this critical moment? Wayne said in anger. No, I'm not. You know very well that despite your arguments and everything, he's always there when you need him. I tried to give him a reason. If he did not make something in that smoothie, and if it wasn't him who was sitting on my chest, then tell me, Silva, why were you standing here when I was finally able to move? The way he asked seemed like he was determined by his doubt. It's because when I entered the room, I saw you sleeping with your eyes open and you were sweating badly. Just when I was about to shake you, you woke up on your own and started shouting at me. I'm telling you, what you experienced was an episode of sleep paralysis, he said tiredly. That's what I was about to say. Trust me, I used to have them, and these hallucinations can get crazy, I said. He somewhat seemed convinced from our argument, and even if he wasn't, I wasn't going to let this go, since I'd already been a victim of sleep paralysis, which caused me to misunderstand someone who used to be very dear to me. I had feared and suffered for years before overcoming this, but I wasn't going to let the same thing happen to these two. That's why I had decided to take him to a sleep doctor even by force if needed. My name is Angela Parker. I'm a final year journalism student, and our class is supposed to go make a documentary film in the nearby jungle. The teacher divided us into five teams, and each one of us had to come up with an excellent and unique idea. We would be assigned marks based on the final version of our films. Each team was to explore different parts of the jungle and choose a topic for their film. Two teachers for each team were also assigned for our teams, who were supposed to overlook our projects and for our safety. 
Jonathan, Carlos, Grace, Sammy, Martha, Kevin, Mr. Joan, and Mr. Andrew were on my team, and we were assigned the South area for our documentary film. We were supposed to spend seven days here to collect the materials, and after we finished filming, another two days would be given to us for editing and finishing up the final versions of our documentaries. The topic we chose was the decreasing wildlife. It was about the animals who were dying and the number of wild animals decreasing by the cutting of forests by humans and about the animals that are leaving their habitats. I know looking at the topic we had chosen, the time we were given was very less, but we were determined to win the top marks for this documentary. Anyway, our team set off for the destination a day prior as others did as well. It was because reaching the forest would also take up a day of our time, and so we were granted permission to leave early. Everyone had brought whatever materials were needed for the documentary, and the trip included food, tents, water, and other things as well. We reached it after a long nine hours of driving, which was exhausting in itself. As we entered the jungle, it felt unusually hot and dry in there. Maybe I felt it because of the sudden change in my surrounding and atmosphere. So we went ahead and set up tents to rest for a few hours before starting our work. Don't you feel a weird, unusual stir among small animals? Kevin said in a worried tone. Where did you even spot small animals? Even I did not see one yet. Carlos asked in a sarcastic tone, which made the rest of them laugh, except for me, because Kevin was right. I saw on my way that the birds were acting strange. I think we should head back, Sammy suggested. And why would we do that? Martha asked in a rude tone. I think Sammy is right. The weather and the way animals are reacting, something is wrong here. As I said that, the rest of them turned and looked at the teachers, hoping they would say something. The two teachers looked at us in confusion for a few moments, and then Mr. Andrew said, no one is going anywhere, and we will be proceeding with the documentary film first thing in the morning. Yes, kids, Mr. Andrew is right, so go on and eat your dinner and go to sleep, because from tomorrow, you might not get it, Mr. Joan added and walked to his tent. Bullshit, let's just go, team. Jonathan, who was the leader of our team, said, walked away. I knew that he was also sensing the danger looking at the surroundings but we had no other choice but to follow the order teachers gave us. After having dinner, we went to our tents, and everyone prepared to sleep. That was when we heard Mr. Andrew scream, who went to pee ten minutes ago. Everyone rushed in the direction of screams, only to find him get torn apart limb from limb by two tigers, who seemed like they were fighting over him, thinking of him as food. We did not dare to go anywhere near them to try and save Mr. Andrew, so we ran to our tent. That is when we heard more tigers approaching us, so we changed our direction to the car and immediately got in and locked the doors. Where's Martha? I noticed her missing, so I asked worryingly. I don't know, maybe she's in the other car. As Sammy said, a tiger jumped on the front of our car and started to attack it. It looked like he was set on destroying the car and taking us out. And then, two more tigers appeared. At this rate, they're going to break their way into the car. Carlos's voice was trembling while saying this. At the same moment, we heard Martha scream coming from the direction where our tents were. I suppose she was trying to hide there when we ran toward the car. We gotta do something, I said in a weak voice. What are we supposed to do? These tigers are surrounding us. It was Sammy, and she was right. We did not have a chance to think of saving anyone other than ourselves. The tigers stopped attacking the car, and they started to walk in circles around us. After half an hour or so, they stopped and sat near the car and kept looking in our direction. Let's just start the car and get out of this place, Carlos whispered to us. But none of us know how to drive a car, and even if we did, our stuff is back in our tents. We can't just leave without them, Sammy replied. What is more important to you, your stuff or your life? Carlos said in frustration. Carlos is right. Sam, we gotta get out of here somehow. But Carlos, Sam is also right. None of us know how to drive. I looked at him and said this in a concerned voice. About that, 
I know how to drive. I just said I didn't because I did not want to drive for 10 hours all the way here, Carlos said while trying to hide his gaze from us. We all agreed to his plan, and then he started the car. From the voice of the engine starting, the tigers got up, and as they charged towards us, Carlos drove the car away from them. I turned my head to see if others were safe, and saw the other car also followed behind as tigers chased them as well. After about 15 or 20 minutes, they stopped chasing us, and we managed to get out of the jungle within an hour or so. When we were sure that we were out of danger, we stopped the car and waited for Jonathan's car. They were 10 minutes behind us, and the moment they caught up, we noticed that there were only three people in the car, Jonathan, Mr. Joan, and Grace. Where's Kevin? Sammy asked with a trembling voice when she did not see her boyfriend. I'm sorry, Sam, but we couldn't risk our lives with Kevin, Mr. Jones said. Sammy broke down and started bawling her eyes out, while Grace explained that he tried to sneak to the tents when the tigers were calm, but they drove off leaving him the moment they heard tigers getting up again. We drove back to the town, and no one spoke a word the entire way back. The only sounds were of the wind and the sniffling Sammy. After another ten hours, and we entered the town border, Carlos dropped each one of us off to our houses and then left for his own. The next day in college, we were called to the director's office, who informed us that we were not the only ones who faced that situation. Two students from another team had returned with similar news. A few days later, we got the news that a fire had broken out in the jungle, and fire departments were trying to put it out. I guess since the other animals went in hiding or ran away, the tigers must have been hungry, and that must be the reason they attacked us. What was even more surprising to me was that while we were trying to save our lives, Jonathan managed to record the entire attack and submitted the film for our documentary. I don't know why, but this made me feel sick and horrified, but changed the name of the topic to Predators. Another one? Amy asked when I showed her the picture of a black kitten with a miniature red bell on her neck. Someone had posted that their cat got missing in North End, one of our neighborhoods in Boston. I know, right? This is the fourth one I've seen this month, and that is on an anonymous website. I don't know how much more have gone missing, I said while looking at its picture. Do you think a wild animal is running loose in the area? She asked, looking outside the window suspiciously. I don't believe so, because if there was, someone might have spotted it by now. I corrected my posture as I put my phone aside and grabbed the laptop to do some work. Maybe these cats weren't getting treated properly, and that's why they ran away. Or they might have gotten lost after getting scared, Amy suggested, looking closely at her phone. It could be, but I hope wherever they are, they stay safe. I opened a mail from my office while saying that and got busy with work. I'm the kind of person who always had a love for animals. Doesn't matter what animal it was, I always felt attached to them. I had a few pets growing up who I loved unconditionally. Even now I have two cats who are naughty as hell, but they're still the apple of my eyes. For some reason, I feel a special connection towards cats. I'm drawn to them more than any other animal. I don't know if it's their nature about loving the few people they trust unconditionally, the way they show affection, or their cute appearance, but I get the feeling that they understand us more than we do ourselves. By the way, you're coming to Kayla's party with me, she announced standing up. What? No, please, Amy. I looked at her in an opposing manner, but despite my efforts, she didn't look me in the eye, knowing full well that the innocent eyes I was making would probably break her. I hear no excuses. Be ready by seven. I'll pick you up. I heard her voice from the hallway as she walked away, followed by the slamming noise of the door. Ugh! I kicked the air in frustration as I threw myself on the bed, since there was nothing I could do except groan at the moment. I knew very well that despite my several protests, she would still drag me there, so I got up when I couldn't find a valid excuse that would be able to convince Amy and went to the bathroom to take a bath. 
For someone who was used to drawing comics all day, a social gathering such as a party was too much. But she was still reluctant on taking me there because in my opinion, I had started to hibernate at this point and needed some air. After an hour long bath, I went to my wardrobe and found the cleanest, most decent party wear attire I owned and put it on. Since it had been so long, it was taking more time than usual to get myself ready. She was ready when she said she would be and picked me up at 7, because I looked at the time when she said she arrived and it was correct, at 7pm. She gave my attire an appreciating smile and walked me outside the house. She went to start her car as I locked my house. When we were driving to Kayla's house, I saw a black kitten who must be around the age of 6 to 7 months on the crosswalk, and by the looks at it, one of her legs looked injured. After parking the car on the side of the road, we went near her, and since sudden touch could scare her away, we crouched down. She meowed a couple times, so we tried picking her up, but she got terrified and started running away. As we followed the kitten, it led us to an old-looking building that seemed empty. When we stomped in our tracks, hesitant to follow her further, she stopped at a distance as well. Judging by the way she looked at us, it felt as if she wanted us to follow her, so we did only to stop in front of a shabby looking apartment. It looked pretty dirty, even from the outside, and the bad odor coming throughout the area was unbearable that we had to cover our noses even from such a distance. Trust me, it was as if something had died inside and had been rotting for days. The apartment seemed locked, so we started to turn back, but that was when we heard multiple faint meows coming from inside the apartment. We tried to look for a window or something of that sort to peek inside, but by the looks of it, it felt like the apartment didn't have windows. There was nothing we could do. But the way this kitten looked at us, it seemed like she called us for something. Possibly her family was stuck in there, and she wanted us to rescue them. Linda, look. I looked in the direction Amy pointed, and felt a little shocked to see a miniature red bell around the kitten's neck. Isn't that the same picture from the pictures earlier? After saying that, I took out my phone and opened the 4chan website, hoping that the thread hadn't been lost yet. Luckily, there was still time, so I matched the picture, and it was her. Don't tell me, is this a hoarding situation? Amy looked toward the house as she said that. We figured if this cat was able to escape the apartment, then there was a window. We just needed to find it. As we looked harder, we were able to find a small window, only enough for the kitty to pass through but it was too high and on the edge for us to look through it. And looking at how we were on the second floor, we could die if we lose our balance, even in the slightest. We decided to shoot an arrow in the air and call 911, telling that animal abuse had happened there since someone had kidnapped multiple cats and locked them in the apartment. They told me that it was going to take about 15 to 20 minutes to reach the place, so we decided to keep watch around in case the hoarders decide to show up and pull something. And we were right to do so, because we saw a woman in her late 30s walking toward the apartment. She stopped in her tracks for a brief moment, but then walked to us so that everything was normal. Well, hello, ladies. Looks like you found Lucy over here. She tried to pick up the black cat, but Amy was quick to grab her first and hand her to me. The woman looked alarmed as if she had caught on to us, so her expression changed within seconds. She took out a small taser and aimed it at us. Hand over my cat, or you will regret it. She sounded like a man-woman, and by the sounds of it, the cat inside her backpack had woken up. The police arrived at the same moment. She did try to run away, but we were quick to catch her. Lucky for us that she wasn't able to use her weapon on us. One of the officers arrested her and took her taser gun, while the other one opened the apartment door, and even put their hands on the noses from the sudden rotting smell that gushed out of the apartment. There were around 30 cats locked inside small cages at the place, and more than a dozen cats seemed dead. I couldn't believe how cruel she was to use such a thing on such innocent animals. It seems like all she scared about was collecting them in their lives, and death due to her actions didn't matter. I recognized some of them from the pictures I had seen, so I took a picture of the place and posted it on 4chan, informing others about the incident, along with the lines that if they wanted one of these were their cat, they could come and take them from the local animal hospital where they would be getting treatment. 
I also provided them with my number to contact me for their cats. You wouldn't believe, but all those cats were stolen, and for the next few days I received calls from their owners. They all showed me their past pictures to assure me that they were their cats. It's a relief that all of them were able to return safely to their homes, except for two cats who seemed to be stray, or it might be that their previous owner couldn't get the news. My heart broke when I received phone calls from those whose cats had already been dead because of that one psycho woman who was still trying to justify herself in prison, that she did all this because she loved them. As her animal cruelty is a federal felony, she was sentenced to seven years in prison, and I hope by the time she gets out she learned her lesson. The current updates on those two cats are that they are living with us, and had gotten much healthier than when we found them. Born in Lanchester, Madeline McCann was a three years old gorgeous girl. She had blonde hair, blue-green eyes, and a small spot on her left calf, and a distinctive dark strip on the iris of her right eyes. She lived with her family, which included her parents and her two old twin siblings in Rothley, Lanchestershire. One day, the family decided to take a holiday vacation to the Portugal, along with some family friends. They arrived there on the 27th of April 2007 for their seven-night spring break. During the vacation, they stayed in a holiday apartment hostel in Leia da Luz, Portugal. There were a total of nine adults and eight children staying there, but during their stay, Madeline got disappeared from the apartment. On the 3rd of May 2007, the children enjoyed their morning at the kids' club, and after that, they went back to the apartment for lunch. After lunch, they headed to the pool, and there, Kate took a picture of her husband along with Madeline and her two years old daughter. When they were finished with enjoying in the pool, the parents put the kids to the kids' club again, and around 6 p.m., they were taken back to the apartment by Kate. The family tucked in their children to sleep at around 8 p.m., at the time, Madeline was wearing a pink and white short sleeve pajamas and slept near a soft toy, Cuddle Cat. The family left the Ocean's Club Open Air Tapas restaurant, which was located on the other side of the pool along with the rest of the friends. Gary went to check on the children around 9 p.m., and at the time, they were safe and sound sleeping. Kate again wanted to check on the children around 9.30 p.m., but Matthew Oldfield, one of the top of seven, said he will do it while checking for their own children on the next door apartment. But even after seeing the children's bedroom door open, he did not check if the children are safely there or not. Kate then decided to check on the children on her own around 10 p.m. She entered the apartment hostel through the unlocked patio doors, which was on the back, and she noticed that the children's bedroom door was open. She rushed there and tried to close the door. It slammed, and then she saw the window shutter was wide open. She checked over to where Madeline was sleeping, but she wasn't there. She had disappeared. Her stuffed toy and blanket was still there, except her. She searched the apartment, but when she could not find Madeline anywhere, she ran back to the restaurant and started screaming, Madeline's gone! Someone has taken her! The police were called instantly, and the missing child protocol was activated. At first, the staff members assumed that Madeline had wandered off somewhere and searched for her until 4.30 a.m., but she still wasn't found. The police arrived, and they searched the area for a brief period of time, and after that, they called the crime police, the PJ. The PJ arrived after 10 minutes, around 1 a.m. after being alerted. They could not search door to door because of the mistake of not providing them the description of Madeline. They took some samples from her bedroom and sent it to the forensic lab for tests. A man named Robert Murat asked about the case of a journalist of Sunday Mirror, and because the first suspect after 12 days of Madeline's disappearance. The reason was because he lived near the apartment and was at home the entire day. When questioned, he told the police that he just wanted to help because he also had a daughter around the same age living in England. After being a suspect for almost a year, a status as a suspect was removed when the police couldn't find any link between him and his friends with the disappearance. 
Reportedly, some witnesses had seen some burglars were seen entering the area through the windows within 17 days before the disappearance. There were also two men seen asking money for an orphanage charity around the same days within the area. In the late afternoon of the 3rd of May, a girl saw a man leaving the apartment from her balcony. The man came from the ground floor and shut the door quietly, which raised the suspicion. Two blonde men were also seen near the area. Many people were suspect at the time, including Madeline's parents. They thought that Mary is trying to create a false abduction story, and she may have been died due to an accident, and her parents may have hidden her body. The suspicion rose because they had left children asleep alone, and everything was okay before Kate found her missing. They were given the title of suspect in September 2007, but it was lifted in July 2008 due to lack of evidence. The parents decided to continue their own investigation and hired private detectives until Scotland Yard opened its own inquiry in 2011, and it was called as Operation Grange. The team had 29 detectives and 8 civilians. They concluded that it must be a planned abduction or a burglary gone wrong. In 2013, Scotland Yard found images which were released as well, in which a man was seen carrying a child on the same day as Madeline's appearance. The case was reopened by the Portuguese police in 2015. Christian Bruckner, also known as Christian B., a convicted sex offender, was ordered an inquiry in June 2020 by the police prosecutor of the German city. It was believed that he had been living in a borrowed VW camper van in the Argov region during the time when Madeline has disappeared. His girlfriend at the time also informed that he told her the night before that he had some work tomorrow. After Madeline's disappearance, his car was registered for a new owner. He was also previously had convicted for child sexual abuse and drug trafficking and is currently serving in prison for the rape of a 72-year-old. In October 2021, according to the reports by Mirror, Walter had been convicted that Christian Bruckner kidnapped and later had murdered Madeline. The trials are being held, and the further investigation is still going on for the case of Madeline McCann. This is probably going to turn out less of a story and more like a confession. Only my ex misses and a few close mates know about what I'm about to tell you. Otherwise, you'd never guess it just from looking at me. You'd think I was some balding, church going Middle Englander whose pulse had never risen about 70 beats per minute. But for about six months back in the mid 1980s, I led quite a different life from the one I have now. You see, I just married my then girlfriend and we were in the process of starting up a little family. And right when she was three months pregnant, Margaret Thratcher's Tory government decided to throw a spanner in the works. I lost my job. I was on the dole. I had a baby on the way and it was looking like we were going to lose the house. I tried my best to find a job that would meet our expenses, but it was almost impossible. And as time went by, I got increasingly desperate and increasingly depressed, and I wasn't doing my job as the main breadwinner. Now this is where Jip comes into the picture. Obviously the Jip isn't the real guy's name, and I don't reckon he'd appreciate me gobbling off about our mutual history. So I'll just use his old nickname that I don't imagine he goes by anymore. Me and Jeb knew each other since secondary school, and although we weren't exactly best mates, we were still quite pally and lead on to each other if ever we are out and about. So one day, I'm on my way back from the door when I see Jeb outside one of the local pubs. I say hi, I have a whinge about the lines on the door, and turns out he was on his way into the pub, so he invites me in for a drink. I'm absolutely skin flint. At this point, I didn't have two pennies to rub together after putting food in the cupboards. But as much as I politely decline him, he insists on getting me a few pints. The clincher for me was him saying, You look dead stress, mate. I reckon you deserve a pint. Never a truer word was said. 
the first sip of the pint was like a wave of calm rusher over me. Not so much because of the ale, but because I realized it had been about two or three months since I'd actually sat down and drank a freshly pulled pint of lager. And let me tell you, I hadn't missed it. Then when it comes to paying, Jeb pulls out his proper wad of notes, all 20s as well, and immediately my mind is back on my money troubles. So obviously, this seeps into the conversation, and I end up telling him about the redundancy. At the door wasn't enough to get baby clothes, all my woes basically. Jeb then gets out this little wad of notes, looks me in the eye, and says, How much do you need? This is where I can hear a lot of you saying, why don't you just take the money? Are you mental? You know what? You're right. I should have just swallowed my pride in taking his money, even if it made me feel pathetic. But that's just it, isn't it? Pride. People get weird when it comes to their egos, and for whatever reason, my ego just couldn't let me accept his charity. And even if loads of you don't get why I refused it, that doesn't really matter. Because Jeb did. Jeb saw that pride in me and was true to his nature. He saw an opportunity. You see, Jeb came in to remind me of an old war film my dad used to watch whenever it was on the telly. It's about this American prisoner in a Japanese prisoner of war camp who basically ends up running the place because he smuggles in whatever contraband people want. He gives people what they want. And in turn, he uses that to manipulate them. This bloke ends up with the name King Rat. And let me tell you, Jeb was King Rat. So instead of just offering me money, he offered me a job. He said he'd pay me 300 pounds to pick up a car for him. Only trouble was that he bought the car from a bloke in Bristol. So that meant getting the train down there so I could drive it back. For reference, 300 pounds was a lot of money for what he was asking me to do which amounted to maybe half a day's work at the most. I knew that there was a catch, that the car might be in a bad neck or, God forbid, it might be stolen. But I really wasn't in the position to be turning down that kind of money, especially when he said that if I got the car back in one piece, there'd be more work in it for me. So that's how I started working with, or more accurately, for Jeb. I thought he was a used car dealer. I really was that innocent. But after a couple of runs, he let me in on a little secret. The cars weren't the object of value in those little transactions. It was what was in them. I had driven four different cars around various parts of the UK at that point, and not once did I realize that hollowed out compartments of the doors that had been stuffed with imported Moroccan hashish. What was I going to do? Kick off, resign? I knew that there was a catch. I was just a bit annoyed that I hadn't been fully informed from the get-go. But then again, ignorance is bliss, isn't it? And Jib said that the very same ignorance was like a superpower. I'd passed police cars countless times, and I even stopped to ask for directions from one at one point. And at no point was I nervous, twitchy, or anything else that might have alerted them to exactly what I was transporting. And on top of that, I was 26 going on 40. I looked like a bloody PE teacher or something. You'd never suspect me. I'll admit that. After that, I got way too comfy making the journeys. My doll disguise must have gotten in my head a bit, because when Jim offered me what amounted to a promotion, I jumped at the chance. In these new jobs, my pay would be about 650 pounds a round, just about double the pay. And some of the trips would be to the next city over from us an hour's driving time tops. It was a no-brainer. Half the work for double the pay? The only question was what I'd be transporting. And I'll never forget what Jib responded with when I asked him what would be in the cars. Do you really want to know? He said. No, I really didn't. As long as it wasn't a dead body in the boot or something equally as sinister... I really didn't want to know. So I started making these runs to a city relatively close by to us three times a week, getting the train out there, picking up a car from these Turkish blokes, and then driving back home. 
and I was getting just shy of two grand a week for it. The wife was ecstatic. I was telling her the half-truth that I was selling used cars with an old mate from school, and she was far too chuffed to ask any probing questions, but others did. And I ended up losing a couple of workmates because they thought I was holding out on them hoarding the wealth or something. But Jib had me swear not to say a thing to anyone, and if I tried to get them in the door, he'd probably have dropped me like a live grenade. For three months, I worked that job, and the whole time, the cash was just rolling in. There was only ever one close call when a traffic cop on a motorbike pulled me over for having a faulty brake light. When I brought it up with Jim, he assured me that every car would undergo a full mod before I ever touched it. After that, there were no problems. Actually, got quite pally with the Turkish bloats. I picked the cars up from two. They were in a little restaurant slash cafe type thing, and I used to pick the cars up from the delivery entrance around the back. The blokes would be sitting around this little table chain smoking cigars and drinking this muddy looking coffee. They'd say hello, shake my hand, and sometimes offer me a coffee or one of their little syrupy pastries. Sometimes I'd partake, but mostly not. Then I'd take the keys off them, get in the car, and bugger off back home. Every single time the restaurant would be buzzing, the shutters at the back would be open. It was a seamless transition of goods, very subtle. That is right in plain sight. There was never any fuss, never any danger. It was always the same routine. This is why when I turn up at the Turkish place one Friday night and the place was closed, my spider senses started to tingle. I go around the back to see the shutters down, but it's not like I could have just said, oh well, it's closed, I have to just get the train home. There was a lot of money at stake. It's not like it could have just gone back empty-handed. People have been killed for losing smaller amounts of drugs than that. It's just assumed you've stolen it. So I walk up to the shutters, and I can hear someone talking on the other side. Brilliant, I think. The meeting is still on. So I give the shutters a few knocks and wait for them to be open. As soon as I knock, the voices go quiet. And then... No one opens the shutters either. Again, my spidey senses are tingling, and I take it upon myself to announce who it is just in case they think I'm the police or something. As soon as I do, I hear someone fiddling with the shutters. Then they start to slide open before stopping at about two feet. Again, very weird, and it's just silent on the other side. I call up hello quite softly using one of the Turkish bloke's names. All I hear is, come in, from the other side. So doing as I'm asked, I crouch down to crawl under the shutter. Then, just as I emerge on the other side, someone kicks me in the face so hard it makes my ears ring. All I can hear as I pick myself up is, get on your front, lay down on your front, before someone starts kneeling in the back of my back. It's the police. I remember thinking, you absolute chucklehead, you've gone and got yourself caught red-handed. I thought to myself, only when they didn't handcuff me. Instead, they'd started to dye my hands with something that I'd later learn was a kind of industrial strength sticky tape. My bell had been well and truly rang, but even in my punch-drunk haze, it hit me that there was something wrong with the situation. And unless he was some undercover bloke forced to carry tape instead of handcuffs or whatever, I might be in a lot more trouble than I first anticipated. Once my wrists, mouth, and ankles are taped up, the bloke then drags me to a corner of the stockroom where I find he tied up and gagged the four Turkish blokes. Each of them had the absolute senses beaten out of them my heart racing as I get to thinking that I'm about to get the same treatment. But instead, he seems to just ignore me and resume some kind of speech he must have been giving the Turkish blokes. And that's when it slowly became clear who it was. It wasn't the police. It wasn't even some other gang or drug dealers with some axe to grind. It was a vigilante. I won't repeat exactly what he said. It was quite a long, drawn-out, and terrifying affair, and I think every third word would be the F word. And this is about to get obscene as it is. 
So I'll just sum it up. And what he said, what he kept referencing, was someone who died. I thought the Turks might have killed someone, and in a matter of speaking, I suppose they did. Because the bloke then LEDs on that it was his daughter that had died from heroin use, possibly having an overdose. But it could have been some other complication resulting from her addiction he never specified. Then at one point, he started ranting about how you sell it, but you don't use it. And I suddenly see that there are these big cling-filmed wrap packages on the table. The bloke must have arrived before they'd loaded the car up and maybe even before the staff had arrived for the evening service. And all the evidence he needed that they'd sold heroin was right there for all to see. God knows how he found them, but he had. And for a long, it didn't look like any of us were going to get out of there alive. The first thing he did was start cutting open some of the packages while he was on his salad, but don't use it rat. Then he starts trying to shovel it up some of the bloke's nose, working his way around, until he actually tried doing it to me too. I thought I'd had it, have some well-times exhale and clean my nostrils out as he moved back onto the other blokes in a frenzy the whole time. I am just terrified. He's going to start using the knife in his hand, and that we're just seconds away from being slaughtered like sheep. But instead, he starts cutting the package wide open and dumping the contents all over us. He goes back for another and dumps the one on us, ranting and raving the whole time about how we're going to regret the day we're born. I just kept picturing the little girl I never get to see grow up. My ex missus was less than a month from her due date, and the thought of her getting the news had been murdered was all I could think about. Not only that, but her finding out where I'd been getting the money from, that's what really got me the shame she'd feel, and the secret she'd have to keep from our daughter. I started to well up. I was so very, very out of my depth. I had given every bloody penny of that money back if I could just get back to my wife safely. And for the first time in my life, I actually prayed to God for literal salvation. Remember way back at the start when I said church going? This is why the whole time I'm praying I've got my eyes sealed shut. I couldn't bear to watch the vigilante bloke stuck stabbing, knowing he'd probably work his way through all four Turkish blokes before finally turning his attentions to me. But in the end, I had to open them. I just couldn't stop myself. And when I did, I saw that God had answered my prayers. One of the Turkish blokes had somehow, God only knows, managed to work one of his hands out of the tape. To this day, the only way I can see him managing it is if he was cursed or blessed with being extremely sweaty. But either way, I just watched as a vigilante turns his back on us to fetch another package before the Turkish bloke just launches himself at him. I didn't really get a good look at what followed. It just looked like a lot of squirming arms and legs from where I was lying. Soundtracked by this man, a cacophony of grunts and Turkish swear words. But eventually, the vigilante fella goes limp, and the Turkish fella rolls off of him and crawls over to cut us free. About half an hour later, I'm sitting in a shuttered and empty Turkish restaurant, drinking this ultra-strong Turkish spirit and smoking my first ever cigarette. The Turk took my clothes off of me, I'm guessing to burn. So I sat there, it was basically a waiter's uniform smoking and drinking until the shakes were gone. In the meantime, now all kinds of different Turkish blokes turned up, presumably to deal with the vigilante's body and to clean everything down. By the time they let me back in the delivery room, it looked as good as new. Everything was clean and sparkly. The car had been wiped down. The fella had just completely disappeared. Finally, three hours after I arrived, I took the car keys and drove back home. When I arrived, I collected my wages and thanked him for the opportunity, but told him that that'd be my last delivery. When he asked why, I told them everything. And when I was done, he had to pick his jaw up off the floor. He ended up offering me a few hundred quid more on each run if I chose to carry on. But all I could think about was the moment I realized I might never see my kid grow up 
and how no amount of money was worth risking that for. I ended up going back to the university during my daughter's first few years, and I'm happy to say that by the time she'd mastered potty training, I was working in this newfangled field of informational technology, a career choice that turned out to have a lot more longevity to it than I foolishly first anticipated. I retired this year, and I'm proud to say that I have a few quid tucked away, at least enough to make myself comfortable. I and the ex-missus are on good terms. I see my daughter and young son a fair bit too, so can't complain there either. I'd like to think I've earned my twilight years. And it might sound a bit up to me here, but I think I'll appreciate them more than most. Because I still remember a time in my life when things could have gone very differently, and in more ways than one. And then remember how that horrible cycle of greed, suffering, and death just carries on rolling, sight unseen, forever and ever. Back when I was a sophomore in college, I had this weird, uber-shifty Armenian roommate called Tigran. He gave off the strongest serial killer vibes ever. He was a weird loner type, unhealthy obsession with all things lewd, kept a knife collection for some reason. Uh, like I was considering asking for a dorm transfer almost as soon as I met the guy. But then I move in, a few months go by, and he just sort of keeps to himself. So, in the end, it wasn't all that bad, and I didn't seek the transfer. Then one night, I just so happened to be watching the evening news when I catch a story about a series of attacks targeting girls on campus. Obviously, with it being so close to home, it piques my interest and I start paying attention. That's when they show a sketch artist's drawings of the suspected attacker, and the guy they show on screen looks almost exactly like Tigran. Same dark hair and eyes, same sloping brow and wide features. I mean, it was like a Snapchat filter sketch rendering of his face, almost identical. Immediately, I'm like, no way. He can't actually be the one. Because him being a serial killer was just a running joke. He couldn't actually have been one. But then again, he did stay late at the library most nights, and if he wasn't at the library, he was night jogging, as he put it. I never heard of anyone running in the dark before in my life, so as you can imagine, I get this horrible twinge of fear in my gut that Tigran is actually the one attacking these girls. Only, and I know this might sound dumb, but I didn't want to just pick up the phone and call 911 on the guy just because he was a night owl who looked similar to a sketch. I mean, what if it turned out to be a totally different dude, and I end up ruining Tigran's academic year by embroiling him in some kind of nightmare false accusation. So, I decided to wait it out. Keep a close eye on him, and if he carried on with his sketchy nocturnal pursuits, or if there was another attack, then I'd call the campus cop's tip line and leave an anonymous message. About a week goes by, it's like coming up on 10pm and Tigran gets home late from wherever he's been. I casually drop a little question in there like, how's it been? Been busy? Where'd you just get back from? Then right as he's about to answer, I notice all these red marks up and down his arm. I feign a bathroom visit to get a little look at them, and I can clearly see what look like scratches up and down his forearms. I'm in the bathroom like, oh god. Oh god, he's got those scratches from a victim. Classic defense wounds, and I bet I'll hear about it tomorrow on the news. Then, when I'm casually like, Oh, whoa, buddy, those scratches look nasty, how'd you get them? He replies that he just started taking MMA lessons. MMA lessons? Not jujitsu, or strike training, or BJJ, just a super vague excuse of MMA lessons. After that, I'm almost 100% convinced it's him attacking girls around campus. Only I can't risk telling on him and him not catching any charges, as I got it in my head that he'd like, know it was me or something. So, I hatched the dumbest plan ever to follow him at night and catch him in the act. I really did. That way, in my mind at least, I could potentially catch him red-handed, maybe stop it and tackle him, and basically sit on the guy until the cops showed up having saved the day with zero repercussions from a psychopath serial killer roommate. Then maybe like two or three nights later, I 
hear Tigran grabbing his keys in preparation to leave. I say, Where are you headed to, bud? And he replies, Just going running? I'll be back late. I just shrug it off, barely looking up from playing Xbox, but when he shuts the door, I sprint into action, throwing on khakis, boots, hoodie, the works, before grabbing my phone for the purposes of gathering evidence. As soon as I see that Tigran, despite being dressed for athletics, is actually just walking to wherever he's going, I'm convinced I'm about to maybe save a life, at least stop a girl from being hideously violated in a way she might never truly recover from. I mean, why else would that guy lie about jogging at night? It was kind of like a spy movie for a while in my mind, me tailing Tigran, staying far enough away that he wouldn't suspect anything but also working my butt off to make sure I didn't just lose track of him. We ended up walking way off campus through a residential area and towards a large public park, and as we get closer and closer to this big clump of bushes, Tigran takes something out of his pocket and slides it over his head. A ski mask. I hadn't been all that scared until I saw that, and something about seeing him slipping on the mask of his predatory alter ego. God, that about scared the living crap out of me. It was like the closest I'll ever come to seeing a legit werewolf transformation or something, actually witnessing a monster being born, or however you want to phrase it. Then, with me slightly out of sight, I watched Tigran walk into the clump of bushes. It had to be his ambush spot of choice, right? The place he'd wait and watch for potential victims to come along before pouncing on them. That had to be enough. I'd creep into the bushes, rip off his ski mask, all while recording a video so I can get definitive proof that it's him committing the acts. So, I start slowly creeping towards the bushes through the darkness when I decide what I'm doing is a really, really bad idea. If Tigran really is some violent attacker, maybe me cornering him in a bush isn't the smartest move. So I decide to call the cops before I make my move, and that way, I won't be waiting too long for them to show up when I finally do tackle him. So I call, tell them the situation, and although the dispatcher tells me not to approach the suspect, I'm so nervous about the prospect of Tigran getting away, and then forced to carry on living with him that I think, screw it. I'm going to nail this guy. I wasn't about to let him get away once he saw flashing lights or something. Then right as I have that exact thought, I start hearing the sound of hushed voices and grunting coming from the bushes where Tigran was hiding. He had someone. Somehow in that time it had taken me to make the 911 call, I had to pull back a little so no one would spot my cell phone light or hear my voice. He had managed to drag someone into the bushes, and he had already started an attack. At that, I launch into action, rushing towards the bushes and shouting something like, Hey, leave her alone. It's dark, but since I'm recording, my phone flashlight is lighting up everything I'm pointing at. So, as I push my way into this little clearing, I see not one, but two guys scatter before turning to face me. My adrenaline goes into overdrive at that moment. I had no idea that I'd be outnumbered and that Tigran had been working as part of a team, so my first thought is like, oh god, I knew this was a bad idea. But still, both guys seem severely caught off guard, and as I start recording faces and reaching for Tigran's ski mask, the other, who wasn't wearing a mask, bolts out of the bushes and flees the scene. Tigran can't go anywhere though, his pants are by his ankles, and as he reaches for them, I shoved him to the floor and told him to stay put. And that's about the time I start to notice the distinct lack of any female victim. I'm shining my light around and I'm on the verge of being like, Hello? Where's the victim? When the thought hits me like a ton of bricks. There was no female victim. And there never was a victim at all. The only people who had been in that bush were Tigran and his male companion. He hadn't been going out to attack girls. He'd been going out for secret meetups with dudes he's been meeting on Grinder. Who knows why the guy in the sketch looks so much like him. Maybe someone had spotted him on his way to or from one of his meetings, then passed his description on to the cops. Either way, 
Not only did they never find the guy who was actually to blame, but Tigran obviously wasn't the one attacking these girls. I mean, he wasn't even into girls. I had to convince the dispatcher that the perpetrators I thought I had caught had gotten away, in which during that time, Tigran did have time to separate himself from that situation, probably went back to the dorm. And without a victim, by the time police showed up, they chalked it up to me just being an overly concerned citizen. They took my muddied up statement and annoyedly told me to be safe and get on with my evening. I ended up apologizing profusely to Tigran, who actually thought I was just some homophobe at first. But once I showed him the composite sketch and explained my hunch, he was willing to forgive me on the condition that I keep his secret. You see... Tigran wasn't just ethnically Armenian. He was actually born there, and since his family were hardcore religious, they wouldn't approve of his lifestyle at all, hence why he kept it under wraps. We were all square, but living with him was still pretty awkward, and it wasn't like we became the best of friends afterward. But still, definitely one of the scariest things I've experienced with a college roommate, and from now on, I'll just mind my own business. I had just turned 22 and was working F&B. They had just promoted me from server to behind the bar and I couldn't be more excited. Now being a young, somewhat attractive female in F&B, you get a lot of creeps. You learn to shrug them off almost as though they're not even being a creep though. But that said, it takes a lot to creep me out. So I'm being trained behind the bar one night when this random guy comes in. I say random because you see the same people every day. He's probably late 40s or early 50s. He sits down, asks me some questions about some beers and makes some general small talk. His first impression was polite and kind of chatty but nothing out of the normal. He finishes his food and orders another beer, then his demeanor changed. He made a comment about how cute I was after I did something ditzy or clumsy. I laughed it off and made a dumb blonde joke. Then out of nowhere, I could just kidnap you. Excuse me? Okay, that's awkward, but I don't want to make this a more awkward situation. I should joke it off. My dumb self responds, <laughs> I'm working at a double. I wish I could get kidnapped. I messed up. What are you doing after work? When do you get off? I immediately become short with him, shutting him down, name dropping my boyfriend left and freaking right. When I started name dropping my boyfriend, he made it very clear that my boyfriend was nothing, that my boyfriend has nothing on him, etc. I was becoming rude at this point to this man and he was still not letting up. I tried just ignoring him and staying away from that general area of the bar, but he would not stop calling me by name. When I go to check on him, if he didn't need anything, I'd walk away. But he wouldn't let me out of his sight, and his stare was predatory, and I kid you not, he would literally lick his lips when I looked his way. I finally admitted defeat and told the girl training me that I couldn't serve him anymore and that I refused to interact with him. She took over and... Anytime he tried calling me over, she'd cut him off and be like, well, how can I help you? I figured he got the hint because he stayed glued to his phone and avoided looking at me or anyone else. I got cut maybe an hour later. I grabbed my car key and walked out the back door and started walking to my car. I wasn't worried about anything until I started crossing the street and the voice inside my head started screaming, run. I took off running to my car, but... Since you could see my driver's side from the back door, my inner voice told me to climb in through the passenger side. As I'm trying to climb into my driver's seat from the passenger side without being seen, I come to the realization that I'm being ridiculous. So I pop my head up and guess what? This idiot is right in front of my car. I almost ran him over, hauling it out of that parking lot. So that's the end of the story, right? wrong. The next night I'm helping my manager with a catering order that's about to be picked up when the phone rings. So I answer the phone. This is Fat Granddaddy, how can I help you? Hey, it's Greg. 
How are you, baby? Uh, fine. I had no idea who it was at this point. I'm glad you answered the phone. I wasn't sure you were working tonight. Uh, you don't know who this is, do you? No? It's Greg from last night, remember? Oh. It finally clicked and I looked mortified and my manager was mean mugging me because I sounded like an idiot and we didn't knock this order out. So did you want to place an order to go? No, baby. I just wanted to make sure you were working. I'll see you soon. I hung up and my manager was like, what was that? So I told her everything about the night before. When he shows up, she had me point him out to her. He sits at the bar, tries to speak to me right off the bat, but the bartender intervenes immediately. Within five minutes of him showing up, the manager was not digging the vibes from him and the way he was watching me. She calls me over and tells me she's sending me home early. Now a restaurant has an upstairs for storage and offices. There are two staircases, one towards the back of the restaurant and one to the front. She tells me to grab my stuff and go to the back staircase. I totally understood what her plan was. I ran up the back stairs and halfway down the front. If you stand about halfway up the front staircase, you can pretty much see the whole restaurant. So I peek my head and my manager immediately waves me to hide back upstairs. A few minutes later, a kitchen guy comes up the stairs and grabs me and we go out the front door. And he walked me around the block to the back parking lot to my car. My manager caught me in the parking lot before I left. Basically, since the back staircase is near the back door, he thought I left and went to follow me out again. My manager confronted him and he was banned. And thankfully, I haven't seen him since. This happened on Halloween of 2019. My friends and I were feeling the spooky vibes of the month and wanted to do something fun and exciting to satisfy our thirst. Being the dumb college students that we were, we decided on exploring somewhere allegedly haunted in the hopes of seeing some genuine paranormal activity. Since we're from Illinois, the popular destination of Bachelors Grove Cemetery immediately came to mind and it was settled upon. Once the sun had set and night had fallen, we were to make our move sneaking into the cemetery after it closed to get the full experience without having to worry about any other visitors. I must admit, I always wanted to do something like this before, but I was genuinely afraid of what might be waiting for us in that cemetery so late at night. Stories always circulated around the various apparitions people had encountered before, the different sounds that chilled them to the bone, and so on. Anyway, all of this was festering inside of me well before we actually started driving over to the cemetery sometime in the evening. It was a pleasantly long drive, but I wasn't really in the mood to think about anything else except for the potential horrors that roam the cemetery for all eternity, or so they say. Couple in the fact that we were going to be trespassing in order to get through in the first place, and I was a nervous wreck. My friends were apparently doing a much better job at keeping their fears in check though. For the sake of the story, I'll call them Logan, Paul, and Eddie. The entire car ride there, they were laughing and joking around, not worried about what we would be getting into or what we might see. Looking back at the whole situation, I should have known that their optimism was a bad sign. No way would we have been able to explore this place without them being the slightest bit nervous. But what's done is done. A little past seven... Once night had finally fallen for real and darkness went on in every direction for as far as the eye could see, we arrived. Parking in the main parking lot was out of the question because we did some looking into it and found that in previous years, local law enforcement liked to wait there and catch any would-be explorers before they could even get inside, so we had a backup plan. Since the actual cemetery was located in the center of a dense forest on all sides, essentially forming a square where all the roads would go around it, we were to park at some restaurant that was open super late and had a huge parking lot, all the way in the back, furthest away from the restaurant itself and closest to the road. This was in the exact opposite direction from the front entrance of the cemetery, 
so we figured this was our best chance of getting in while avoiding any cops in our way. From there, we'd cross the street on foot and have a bit of a walk before arriving at a somewhat hidden path leading into the forest. Taking this back path would take a bit more to get to the actual cemetery itself since there were trees particularly thick and dense, but it was well worth it when considering the alternative. After everything was said and done, we found ourselves beginning our trek onto the path, unsure of how far we'd actually have to go before we find what we were looking for. It was a windy night, and even though it wasn't especially cold or anything, I still remember my teeth chattering and my skin going cold. Aside from the occasional sounds of leaves being crunched under our shoes as we walked, there was absolute silence. My once cheerful and energetic friends were now, all of a sudden, quiet and subdued. Logan in particular had this odd expression on his face, it being illuminated by my phone's flashlight as we walked. It was some sort of cross between fear and pain, like every step he took was causing him physical harm. Before I could question him about it, we found ourselves at our destination. Here we were, in the heart of Bachelor's Grove, with graves all around us and a certain chill in the air. Everyone split up to cover more ground promising to call the others over if they were to encounter something. I didn't want us going too far away from one another, but I also didn't want to seem like a complete baby, so I kept my mouth shut and began exploring. Most of the graves I looked at had withered away from time and the elements, so I couldn't really make out anything that was on the tombstones. The few dates that I could read went back to the late 1800s, and a sinking feeling in my stomach started once I realized these people had been dead and decaying in the ground for over a hundred years. Feeling extremely uncomfortable with this realization, I began to back away from the graves and start to look for my friends to see if they had found anything supernatural, yet when all of a sudden, I heard it. Not just me either, all of us did. It was a low, almost unnoticeable if you weren't paying attention, but... With the way our senses were heightened, there was no way we would miss it. It appeared to be some sort of chanting, and it sounded like it was coming a little bit north from our direction, further in a clearing. I couldn't make any of the words being spoken or if it was even in English, but there was something creepy about the tone, like it was religious and the chanting was some sort of prayer. The voice that was doing the chanting was deep and gravelly, belonging to some man that we couldn't see. The four of us shone our lights on each other to see our expressions and at that moment, we knew what we were going to do. Despite every fiber in my being telling me not to go any further and see what the source of this chanting was, my curiosity got the better of me and I couldn't resist. Eddie whispered to us to turn our lights off completely while he dimmed his just enough to where it wouldn't attract too much attention but we would still be able to see with it. The next few moments we spent creeping towards the noise, the more and more I started to lose it. My breathing was uncontrollable and it felt like my heart was beating a million miles an hour. I was so afraid of what we would find, and yet I still had to know. Finally, after what seemed like an eternity, we had entered the clearing and were a mere few steps away from this chanting. Eddie shone his light in the direction ahead of us and for just a brief moment, we saw a cloaked figure bent over something in the grass, still chanting in that unrecognizable language. The thing in the grass looked like some sort of circle with a mark in the center and I swear to God, I wish I could tell you I'm lying about this, but when I realized what the symbol was, I felt like throwing up. There was no mistake, it was a pentagram made of some strange material. For the moment that Eddie had illuminated the sight in front of us, I had been able to get a glimpse of the pentagram's material being bright red, and I shouldn't have to say any more about that. Once the light from Eddie's phone hit the back of the man's head, he immediately stopped chanting and stood up, still facing the direction of the pentagram. I can only describe the next few minutes as truly unadulterated terror. Before we knew it, he screamed a blood-curdling scream that rattled us to the core and turned around beginning to sprint towards us. Everything happened so fast. I couldn't even make out the man's facial features except for deep, sunken eyes and an expression that radiated pure hatred. 
He really did want to bring us harm. And not wasting any time, we all fled the direction we came from and ran faster than I think any of us had ever ran in our entire lives. I couldn't even scream while running. I was too petrified to make any noise. Maybe it was a miracle, but we somehow managed to retrace our steps all the way through the path we took to enter the cemetery and forest and eventually came out the main road which was devoid of any traffic for the time being. Afraid of what I would see if I looked back, I made a beeline for the car along with the others and hopped into the back seat, not wasting any time to lock the door and roll up the window. We peeled out of there in no time flat and didn't stop driving 20 over the speed limit until we were at least 10 minutes away. Honestly, I have no idea how far or how long that man chased us, but I do know this for sure. We weren't supposed to be there that night, and we must have been interrupting something important of his. I'll never know what it was, and honestly, I don't hope to ever find out. We never did talk about this experience again after that night, and we never went on another trip to somewhere abandoned or haunted ever again either. I think that fright we felt is enough to satisfy us for the rest of our lives, and I'm thankful beyond words that we all managed to get out together, alive. Growing up, my favorite thing in the world was going fishing with my two older brothers. We lived in a very rural area and would often hike out into the woods to go to various creeks to go fishing. It never really caught anything big in the creeks, but it wasn't as much about what we caught as much as it was about spending time with your brothers fishing. Stereotypically, we always got up way early in the morning on fishing day. We would begin hiking out to whichever creek we were going to, and would watch the sun as it stole across the sky. It would be fully light outside as we got to where we were headed to. The scariest thing to ever happen on a fishing trip, of course, happened the first time that we had gotten to a new creek. We had set out that morning, determined to go further into the hills than we normally did. We passed by one or two of our regular fishing spots and kept going deeper and deeper into the woods. We found an absolutely amazing spot. It was thickly wooded, but the creek was huge. It was beautiful, and even had a fallen tree stretched out over it. After we determined that it was sturdy enough, the three of us made our way over to the other side of the creek. We sat our stuff out and began to fish. The day wore on, and we weren't really catching anything. The fishing got boring after a bit, so we decided to do something we normally didn't do. Like I said, the creek was huge and it was quite deep too, so we decided to put aside our fishing poles and go swimming in the creek. I really don't know how long we had been swimming when I noticed that our middle brother stopped doing anything and began staring off in the woods. Our oldest brother asked him what was wrong, and he just motioned to the woods. There's someone out in the woods, watching us, he said. My first thought was that some pervert was out there watching us, but when I followed my brother's finger pointing out towards the woods, those thoughts quickly evaporated. Standing off in the trees was a huge man. It wasn't too dark that we couldn't make out some of his features. He was wearing jeans and a flannel shirt, which struck me as odd as it was pretty warm out. He had a baseball cap on his head that was sitting low over his face. But the most striking feature he had was that he was holding what looked to be a rifle or shotgun in his hand. We weren't sure what to do. Going into the woods, we knew that we were trespassing. We never actually knew whose property we were on, but we did know that the places that we hiked and fished on didn't belong to us. Except up until this point, we had never gotten caught before. Both of us younger boys looked at our brother for instruction as to what to do. He seemed just as worried as we did though, 
and didn't give us any direction. He just kept looking at the man standing there and watched. My brother suggested we try and get ourselves over to our stuff, take it, and leave. However, this was daunting because that was the side of the creek the guy was on. We slowly made our way over to our things. However, before we got to shore, an old hag came running out of the woods, shrieking like a freaking banshee. I got startled and fell back into the water, struggling until my middle brother pulled me back up again. The old nasty woman actually ran over to our things, our poles and our clothes. She started grabbing the things and screaming, Mine! 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 She was gathering all of our things in her arms, dropping a few of them when she had too much in her arms. Yay! Stop that! My oldest brother yelled and began to try and move faster to the shore. My middle brother reached out and put his hand on his shoulder and pointed back to the big guy in the woods. When we moved back towards the shore, he began moving closer and he held the gun up as he walked. Holy shit! I distinctly remember yelling. We're sorry we trespassed on your property! My middle brother shouted, but they didn't pay any attention to us. He's not gonna shoot us! My oldest brother said, and began moving towards the old hag to get his things. As he did though, the old woman saw him and she took a fillet knife out of her pocket and started waving it at my brother. I'll cut you! She screamed at him, her arms still overflowing with our things. By now the big hillbilly was by the shore of the creek, and he had the shotgun cocked and was pointing it at my oldest brother. He of course stopped in his tracks. It was a tense moment as we stood cold in the water with this guy pointing his gun right in our faces. Once the woman had gathered up our clothes and fishing gear in her hands, the guy said one thing to us, Git. We didn't have to be told twice. All three of us swam to the other side of the creek, got out of the water and got out of there. It sucks because we had to walk through the woods in nothing but soaked shorts. We didn't even have shoes and the twigs and rocks and leaves hurt our feet, but we were too scared to even consider going back. We fortunately did not get chewed out for losing our stuff. Our dad told us that there are some messed up people out in the woods and we had to be careful. It was a long time though before we were brave enough to go fishing again. This had to have happened sometime in the early 2000s. My husband was still spending most of the time on the road working for one of the major insurance companies. As a result of this, myself and our young daughter spent the majority of our days alone. A few years prior, we had purchased a new home on a somewhat isolated piece of land and the journey between town and home could often be harrowing, especially at times of heavy rain. Most of the last five miles of the road that led to the house was nothing more than loose gravel and wasn't very wide for that matter. My daughter and I found ourselves stuck on this section of road on a really bad night. I did all that I could to keep our old Subaru on the road, but the rain made visibility almost impossible. It wasn't long until I misjudged one curve and ended up in the ditch. Fortunately, my husband had the foresight to sign us up to one of those roadside assistant programs. I contacted them and was told that the weather was keeping them busy, but they would get to us as soon as possible. Not knowing how long we'd be stuck there, I made my daughter as comfortable as I could and waited. The rain stopped soon after and I was now able to see how far away from home we were. I estimated it was about two and a half miles to the house and considered walking, until remembering no one was at home to retrieve the car later. Help was on its way, so I could wait. Within ten minutes of the accident, I could see the headlights of a truck coming towards us and began to get excited. However, it didn't turn out to be a tow truck. Instead, it was an older man driving a rusty pickup. 
When he saw the car, he slowed down and looked into it as he passed. I thought he was about to offer to pull us out, but he continued down the road. I didn't think anything of it at the time, but five minutes later, the rusty truck approached us coming from the other direction at a very slow speed. He stared at me once again as he passed, even making eye contact with me briefly, but didn't stop. Things were beginning to look odd, but I thought maybe he was lost and turning around to return to the highway. He wasn't obligated to help. Perhaps he thought I was parked instead of stuck. He probably wasn't from around there and was just trying to get home like I was. Things didn't start to get scary until I noticed the same truck coming toward us for a third time. It had gotten completely dark by this point and most women I know feel much less safe once the sun goes down. This situation made things even more sketchy. He did his usual by now slow drive-by. What was different this time was that he stopped the truck after he passed and did a quick three-point turn in the road. He was now facing us again, stopped about ten yards away. Rather than get out and come over to offer aid, he sat in the cab and watched for a few minutes. Only now did he open the door and begin to get out of the truck. Almost as soon as his foot hit the pavement, a pair of headlights appeared from the other direction. The man stayed where he was, just watching and waiting for a minute before it was close enough to see it was a tow truck. Once he saw this, he jumped back in his cab and made a quick U-turn and sped away from us. My heart was stuck in my throat as I watched this play out, and not until I could read the name of the company on the side of the tow truck could I begin to relax. The tow truck driver didn't hesitate to pull his truck in front of us and hook up to my car. I was finally confident he was there to help and I got out to thank him. He had us out of the ditch in a few minutes and we were on our way. For the remainder of the journey I kept my eyes open for the rusty truck and even as I drove up our drive I feared I'd see him lying in wait for me. He was not, thankfully, and I got my daughter into the house for the night. When my husband returned from his latest trip, I told him about what had happened during the last storm, but I left out the part with the strange truck. I knew it would only make him more stressed when he was away, and at that time, he had no other choice but to continue his trips. Because of this latest trouble, he went out and purchased an almost new Jeep with a 4x4 transmission for me. I was over the moon to get it, and... I never got stuck again, even on the muddy parts of our property. It didn't take long for the stranger in the rusty truck to pass from my mind. However, for the next two weeks I caught myself looking for it any time I was on that stretch of road. I had almost completely forgotten about that incident until just recently when I saw a truck similar to it at the store. It of course was not the same one but it caused it all to come flooding back and motivated me to write this. Fortunately, in the preceding years since then, the county has paved and widened the roads and my wonderful husband gets to come home to us every night. I live in a small rural community in the eastern United States. It's a nice little town, and because of my work in the medical field, I've met some interesting folks. I'm also familiar with law enforcement and emergency personnel. Small town life is not as dull and uneventful as people think, especially since everybody knows somebody who knows somebody. I have a lot of stories to share, but since this one just happened, I'll start here. Because it's still very recent and the investigation is ongoing, I have to be vague with some details, but I needed to tell someone. I'm single and live alone. Due to a stalker, I've moved twice, but that's another story for another time. However, it is relevant for this story for multiple reasons. The first reason being that I have a dog for the sake of protection, as well as have motion sensors and outdoor security cameras. The second reason being the location of my home, which is literally down the street from the fire department. I can see it from my living room window right now, and a couple of blocks from the police station. However, Next to the fire department is the road department, which is basically a parking lot where they park their road equipment and empty garage trucks at night and on weekends. Oddly, it doesn't have a security camera. Small town life, I suppose. My house sits on a hill with a good view of that side of the street. 
Due to the incline, the large trees in the front yard, and the half cornfield in the property next to me, most people in the street below wouldn't notice me in the backyard unless they were actively looking. However, I can see the street clearly. This incident happened Saturday evening. The county was holding its annual Independence Day spiel with a community barbecue, music, fireworks, etc. I didn't attend because it's just not my thing. Plus, I have a dog and the sound of fireworks could be traumatizing, as I'm sure many of you know. Before the big show, I took the dog out to relieve herself in the backyard. There was still at least an hour of daylight, but the entire neighborhood was pretty quiet because most everyone was at the fairgrounds or various other holiday events. So when an unfamiliar, large white pickup drove slowly down the street, I noticed. It must have turned around at the end of the street because I saw it again, moving in the opposite direction only about 20 seconds later. This time it turned into the parking lot of the road department. Now, people have been known to toss things into the empty garage trucks, usually at night to avoid getting caught, because they don't want to or they're unable to make the trip to the landfill themselves. Usually it's things like furniture or broken equipment, but I didn't see any of those things in the back of this truck. The driver was a somewhat stocky guy of average height. He took three large black trash bags from the bed of his truck and tossed them one by one into the hopper of the garbage truck. Then he left. Now, I swear I'm not one of those meddling rear window types who always thinks activity is suspicious and that their neighbors are up to no good, but something about this didn't sit right with me. Normally, when I see people tossing their garbage into the trucks and leaving, I don't bother reporting it because it's relatively harmless. But this time, I had a gut feeling. So, I called the police. If anything, they could get the guy for illegally dumping trash from a barbecue or whatever. While I'm on the phone with dispatch, I put my dog inside to cut down on distractions while the officers investigate. A few minutes later, an officer arrived and I crossed the street to meet him, gave him a description of the events and pointed out which of the trucks the man had tossed the bags. He found the bags, took photos, he put on gloves and told me to stay back. The bags were tied in a knot at the top and it took him a minute to untie one because of the gloves and how tight the knot was, but eventually he got it open, looked inside for a few seconds, then twisted it closed and took a few steps back. Dear God, he hissed under his breath. What? It's a body. I felt sick. I could tell he felt sick too. I saw him grow pale. His hand was trembling when he held the radio. Even his voice was shaking as he gave the code to dispatch. The dispatcher sounded confused when she asked him to repeat it. Within ten minutes, the county sheriff was on the scene. Even he looked sick at the contents of the bag. The coroner arrived about ten minutes after that and the first officer walked me back to the house along with another one who arrived at the same time as the coroner. Though I showed the first cop via the app on my phone when I described the events initially, I now showed them the video on a larger screen. The camera caught footage of the truck as it drove by both times, as well as pulling into the parking lot, though unfortunately not a clear view of the license plate or the man tossing the bags out of frame. We watched the footage over and over, pausing frames, the officers taking notes. Ultimately, they requested this footage as well as a copy of the files from the past week to see if the truck had been in the area before. I've also been saving footage until the road department installs their own camera this week. Because this is still fresh, I don't know many more details. I know the body was in pieces, as they said, but I don't know the age of the victim, the gender, cause of death, any of that. Information has been released to the public yet. I don't know if the coroner has ever been able to identify the body yet. A police cruiser has been parked at the fire department next door for constant surveillance in case the guy comes back. The guy who dumped the body was likely a local. How else would he know that he could dump there? He probably thought it would get buried in other people's illegal trash accumulated over the holiday weekend and the sanitation crew wouldn't have bothered to investigate. When I think about how this guy lives in my community, it makes me physically ill. To think that he had clearly scouted the area for a dump site, 
that it may not have been the first time this had happened, that this could happen again. If I hadn't called it in, if I hadn't been in the backyard at the exact moment, or if I had ignored that gut feeling, the victim would have never been found, may never find potential justice, their loved ones may never have closure. In fact, there's a possibility that it might just happen again to another poor soul, and I just hope that it's not me. You might be able to describe 17-year-old David Faraday as the all-American boy. David was clean-cut, a good student and a member of the Boy Scouts of America. He was also apparently something of a moral arbiter, having once confronted a marijuana dealer outside of his high school when the man had apparently been attempting to peddle the drug to members of the student body. After threatening to inform the police, the dealer was said to never have hung around the high school again. And although by today's standards we might consider this to be so-called snitch behavior, David was clearly simply trying to protect his fellow students from something he was concerned would affect their academic performance. He was a good person, with a good heart, and almost all of what he did came from a place of love. But like many boys his age, David found himself increasingly interested in the opposite gender, and there was one particular young lady that caught his attention over all others. Betty Lou Jensen was 16, a year younger than David, but she was incredibly popular and her reputation as a charming, well-mannered young lady preceded her. She was also a very talented artist who took a great deal of interest in all things creative. It was at a local youth function that David got the chance to talk to Betty Lou, and his affection for her seemed to be entirely reciprocated. Betty Lou shared a great deal with him and even invited him to visit her after school so that he could walk her home. After a few weeks of wholesome teenage dating, something of a relationship began to blossom between the two bright-eyed young people. But all was not entirely well as there was another boy who had his eye on Betty Lou, one who was not about to let David have her all to himself. He squared up to David when the young man was waiting outside of Betty Lou's high school and although the conversation didn't become physical, some pretty harsh insults were exchanged and David was warned to stay away from his new girlfriend. Other boys might have been deterred by such a display of possessiveness and aggression, but not David. He was determined to secure his place as the only boy in Betty Lou's life, and so one afternoon on their way home from school, David asked Betty if she'd like to go on a date with him, their first date, and to his absolute elation, Betty Lou said yes. David racked his brain for a solid first date idea, and given that it was late December, decided that a great way to capture that festive romantic spirit would be to take Betty Lou to a local Christmas event. And being the gentleman that he was, he made a promise to her parents to have her back home by 11pm at the very latest. Rumor has it that David and Betty were planning on attending the Christmas themed party with a few other local high school students but perhaps this was simply a cover to reassure the young girl's parents because what we know for certain is that they ended up driving over to Lake Herman Road in David's Rambler station wagon, parking it up in quite a well-known spot that was known to many as Lover's Lane. The whole appeal of the spot near Lake Herman is that it was quiet and unfrequented by members of the public, hence why young couples might use it to gain some privacy for certain unsavory activities. But it wasn't just infatuated lovebirds who noted the location's seclusion, because someone else wished to take advantage of the isolation for something that was considerably more malicious. At some point during their stay up on Lover's Lane, David and Betty Lou noticed another car pull into the spot, one that parked up alongside them before turning its lights off. At first, David and Betty were worried it was the cops, come to arrest them for committing lewd acts in public. But as they peered through the darkness to study the vehicle next to them, it became increasingly obvious that it was not in fact the police. All the young couple could do was watch, growing increasingly scared as the shadowy silhouette in the front seat stayed statue still, staring at them through the passenger's window. Betty Lou told David she was spooked and asked him to see if he could get the person to leave, 
But unlike previous encounters where David's bravery had shown through when confronted with a source of maliciousness, he too was far too frightened to do anything. But as he prepared to start up the Rambler's engine so he could drive Betty Lou out of there, the driver of the other vehicle got out and approached David's side of the Rambler. David was transfixed, frozen in fear like a deer in a car's headlights, but when he saw the mysterious stranger pull out a pistol and aim it at his window, his flight response kicked into gear. Betty threw open the passenger side door, throwing herself from the Rambler before David followed suit but neither kid was fast enough to outrun a bullet. The stranger fired once through the roof of the Rambler, then sprinted around the back to fire another shot at David through the vehicle's rear window. Both shots hit the young man, and he crawled along the ground near the station wagon's back wheel on the passenger side, trying and failing to escape. Betty Lou, however, began to sprint away through the darkness as the first shots were fired, but the stranger was fast, he took aim and fired five shots at the right side of her back, each bullet striking her torso before she fell. As she lay dying in the darkness, the killer turned his attentions back to David, pointing the pistol towards his head and pulling the trigger one last time, sending a bullet crashing into his skull just behind his left ear. Apparently, the killer then simply got back into his car and drove away into the night. Some time later, someone who drove past the spot on Lover's Lane must have seen the bodies lying in the dirt, and then rushed to call the police. David was still breathing when they arrived on the scene, but was completely unresponsive, and was dead on arrival when he was finally taken to a nearby hospital for treatment. The double homicide stunned and horrified the local community, and rumors abounded that there was a crazed, firearm-wielding madman on the loose with it only being a matter of time before they struck again. One of the first people contacted by the police as a potential suspect in the murders was the young man who had confronted David as a result of his own jealousies over his and Betty Lou's blossoming relationship. But it was discovered that this young man had a strong alibi for his whereabouts, meaning there was no way he could have been the mysterious bloodthirsty stranger who pulled into Lover's Lane that night. As the summer of 1969 drew to a close, journalists and law enforcement alike wondered if the teenage lover's killer would ever be found, but little did they know that the nightmare had just began, and what would follow would continue to baffle all those involved for decades to come. Because the man who took David and Betty Lou's lives that evening, the man who relentlessly fired bullet after bullet into the Rambler station wagon, would come to be known by a name that would echo through the annals of true crime all over the world. The Zodiac. Zodiac's identity remains a complete mystery even to this day. The killer's nickname originated from a series of taunting letters and cards sent to the San Francisco Bay Area Press. These letters included four cryptograms based around a number of ciphers, one of which was recently solved by the FBI after over 50 years of research and study. We know for certain that the Zodiac murdered five people in Benicia, Vallejo, Napa County, and San Francisco in the 11 months spanning December of 1968 and October of 1969. It seems he preferred to target young couples, which is how he seemed to have come across David and Betty Lou while the pair were on their first date. Yet despite only five confirmed victims being attributed to the Zodiac, he once claimed to have murdered 32 other people, bringing his total body count to 37 victims. A killing spree that started with two young lovers, so excited to finally have some time alone together on their first date, never being able to imagine that it would end in such a brutal moment of painful finality. So the next time you're on a first date, don't be so quick to go somewhere secluded as you never know who might be watching or following, just ready to turn a perfect romantic moment into a living nightmare. I had a stalker in secondary school. Well, not quite the follow you everywhere and make a shrine out of your hair kind of stalker, but enough to make me feel afraid for my safety on an almost daily basis. It made for a fairly terrifying two years before my mum got married and we moved to the complete other side of London. He was this huge rugby player, very handsome and extremely popular, 
So of course there were absolutely no social repercussions for him, and people basically refused to believe that he'd pay any attention to me at all, let alone anything remotely abusive. When he started obsessing over me, most everyone brushed it off or made excuses for him, but it quickly became an absolute nightmare. He was always making comments towards me, pinching or pulling my hair when no one else was looking. It was creepy because he obviously didn't want anyone to really know what he was doing. He knew it was disturbed, and he knew it would make him look bad if it all came to light. Sometimes he'd say things like, I can smell you, you're about to be on your period, or nice and clean. Always in the creepiest, perviest way imaginable, as if it couldn't get more obvious that he was enjoying it. One of the scariest moments I can recall is when I was scanning the vending machine one morning before class trying to figure out what to have for breakfast. He came up behind me, placed his hands on my waist, pushed me right up against the machine and said very clearly in my ear, One day, I'm going to kidnap you, take you to the forest, tie you up, and screw you until you want it. That was three weeks before our move date, and the only thing that stopped me from going to the head teacher was the fact that it wouldn't be long until I never had to deal with this guy ever again. But I now know that that was the complete wrong approach. Even if you manage to escape someone like that, they just pick a new victim and another and another. They only stop victimizing women when they're actually confronted by authority figures and even then they might be psycho enough to just carry on. So please, if anything like this happens to you, report it to the relevant authorities. Even school staff take stuff like that really, really seriously and won't hesitate to get the police involved if they think that's the right course of action. Back when I was leaving elementary school and entering junior high, some friends, I was 10 to 11 years old, and I decided to make a Ouija board and try to summon some spirits. We did it at school and everything went smoothly. Honestly, it was rather fun than scary and we only made a few questions until we got bored and went home. Back at home, I wanted to do it myself. I spent almost 10 years in the Catholic school, so this was a taboo topic for me, and I started to talk to a spirit of an alleged kid that had passed away, very young. I have to admit that the experiences were quite exciting and at this point some mild paranormal events began to happen. First I'd listened to a child's voice calling out my name. I also sensed him touching me while I was sleeping and saw a few shadows that I thought belonged to this kid. I honestly wasn't afraid of this so I just enjoyed the experience. Until I messed things up. One day I was trying to summon the spirit of someone that had passed away at my house, it was a rental or nearby, and somehow I reached the spirit of a woman that warned me to leave her alone. Being a stupid 11 year old I didn't listen so I kept insisting until she, apparently upset, closed the session and told me I was going to suffer the consequences. And then it all began. First there were shadows, but not the ones I saw before. These were bigger scarier, and appeared more often than before. Also, the whole energy felt heavier than before. Then more noises began to appear. I could hear someone scratching my pillow every night and... One time my bed even shook, slightly, but it did shake. The paranormal phenomenon increased slowly. Soon after that, I actually began to see the woman. The time I remember the best is when I was passing in front of my sister's room and saw a woman undressing in front of the mirror. My first thought, stupidly because my sister was six years old, was that it was her, so I jumped into her room to jokingly scare her. Well, the scared one was me because that room was completely empty. I experienced a lot of things in this time. The ones I remember the most are when I saw a woman walking in my mom's room when she was so tall she reached the ceiling. I never saw her face but only the back of her head and she had really long black hair. Also one time I woke up and I saw a huge shadow right above me which slowly disappeared. Another time I woke up because I was hearing a child screaming in a very horrible way and I realized I had sleeping paralysis. 
I might write about this later in another post because I've had several experiences. I tried to fight it back and I began to hear a woman's laugh. This lasted a few minutes until I could move again. And the last one that really affected me was when I was home alone at night and I saw how my room's door started to move as if though someone was trying to enter. Also the knob was moving back and forth. This happened a lot and only stopped when my mom came back. It was quite frustrating because no one believed me and at first only happened to me but after a while the maids told me that they also saw the woman and they actually did it without having to tell them first and my mom had to admit something was going on when she saw the TV cord rise as if though someone was pulling it and then get disconnected. This eventually stopped. After a while I wasn't afraid anymore so I think maybe it found it boring and the less afraid I was the events became rarer and rarer until I moved to another city and then everything stopped for good. The moral of this fable is never ever try to summon spirits with a Ouija board or by any means at all. How far would you go to find a missing family member? Is there anything you wouldn't do or anywhere you wouldn't go in order to recover a loved one? For many of us, the answer will be a resounding no. We'd do anything for the people close to us. And that's exactly how Sarah Turney felt regarding the disappearance of her older sister, Alyssa, in the year 2001. Over the years, Sarah tried almost every means at her disposal in her quest for answers. She started Facebook and Instagram accounts dedicated to spreading awareness of Alyssa's absence. She started a blog called Justice for Alyssa, which kept track of the ongoing investigations. She reached out to multiple media outlets, both regional and national, actually managing to bag an appearance on Dateline NBC. She started her own podcast, appeared as a guest on other people's, and even attended CrimeCon, the weekend-long event for true crime fans as well as those desperate for leads. She left no stone unturned in her search for justice, but unfortunately, she had no luck in the search for her missing sister. Then, in Sarah's desperation, she turned to TikTok. Sarah later said that she started a TikTok account because she wanted to reach a young audience that hadn't heard about Alyssa's case before. She made sure her video posts included as little of her own speculation and theory as possible, making sure to present only the facts to her new audience. However, she did make it clear that one particular line of inquiry had been almost completely neglected. Her father, Michael Turney, who adopted Alyssa after her mother had died, had never been considered a serious suspect. After announcing she created a TikTok page dedicated to spreading awareness about Alyssa, she also included a word or two about the people who'd had less than positive things to say about it. She made very clear that no matter what anyone said about TikTok or any other medium, if it helped her get closer to answers surrounding Alyssa's disappearance, it would all be worth it. It was all part of her doing the right thing and fighting for justice. To her astonishment, Sarah quickly gained over a million followers on the video app, with each new video post giving her more and more of an audience. In one particular video, Sarah gives a full and frank account of the day her older sister disappeared. At the time, both girls were living with her father, Michael, since their mother, Barbara, had died of cancer. It was her last day of junior year at Paradise Valley High School in Phoenix, Arizona. Sarah who was 12 years old at the time, says she found her sister's usually neat, tidy bedroom looking like it had been struck by a bomb. It was a total mess. The only sign of Alyssa was her Nokia cell phone that was left on the dresser, along with a note saying she'd gone to California to try to make it on her own. In another video, she talked about why exactly she had such a strong hunch that her father was to blame. And needless to say, Michael Turney was much more of a dark personality than he liked to let on. Because seven years after Alyssa first went missing, Phoenix Police Department made a rather worrying discovery of Michael's home whilst on a completely separate investigation. A stash of 26 homemade pipe bombs, three incendiary devices, and two silencers. After he had such volatile equipment confiscated, Michael allowed himself to be interviewed by ABC News. During the interview, he told journalists that he had been planning to take his own life in order to bring attention to Alyssa's case. 
but added that the bombs found in his home had actually been planted there by police officers attempting to frame him for his daughter's disappearance, which he denied having anything to do with. They have no proof whatsoever of anything other than rumors, innuendos, and lies. There's only two people that can confirm whether I did it, and one is me, and the other is Alyssa. Alyssa's not here, and I'm sitting here, and all I can say until hell freezes over, I didn't do a thing to my daughter. In March of 2010, Michael pleaded guilty to possession of the unregistered pipe bombs and was sentenced to seven years in prison for owning the explosives and all the silencers. Since April of last year, Sarah has been uploading TikToks about her father's alleged role in Alyssa's disappearance. In one particular video that has accrued over 13 million views, she shared home VHS footage from March 29, 1997, four years before Alyssa went missing. In another TikTok, Sarah plays what she claims is a recorded conversation she had with her father a few months after he got out of prison in 2017. The meeting took place at a Starbucks and lasted for over an hour. I felt a lot of different emotions afterwards, Sarah says. I was sad that he still refused to give me any answers. I was hoping that putting those statements on TikTok would prompt the police to finally bring him to a grand jury for questioning. In February of 2019, the case was formally submitted to the county attorney's office requesting homicide charges to be made against Michael, but there was no telling if it would actually be taken seriously or not. It would take another six months for the attorney to make a decision. Until then, all anyone could do was wait. Then, to the shock of almost everyone involved in the case, Michael Turney was indicted on charges of murdering his own daughter. Maricopa County attorney Alistair Adele did not elaborate on what exact evidence led to Mr. Turney's arrest, but did confirm that the indictment was issued by a grand jury. She also credited Sarah Turney and her TikToks with having helped solve the case. Sarah Turney, your perseverance and commitment to finding justice for your sister Alyssa is a testament to the love of a sister, and because of that love, Alyssa's light has never gone out and she lives on in the stories and photos you've shared with the community, Adele said. This passion you have, you have demonstrated to her during your journey, is something that will keep Alyssa's memory alive forever. Sarah had said she will continue to make TikTok videos about Alyssa's case until her killer is brought to justice, and whether or not that killer is her own father remains to be seen. Every evening after work, she scans all of her social media accounts on TikTok, Facebook, Instagram, YouTube, plus her blog to see whether anyone has come forward with new information or tips. And then she sits down with the thousands of documents she's acquired that relate to Alyssa's case. I read through approximately 3,000 pages of case documents that were released to the public by the police and gone through a few hundred hours of home footage, video, and interviews that I've conducted with Alyssa's friends and family, she says. And no, I won't ever stop. Sarah and Alyssa's story is truly inspirational. A search for justice fueled by the love between two sisters. It's a reminder that those close to us will never stop fighting in our corner, even after we're long gone. But it's also a reminder that sometimes, it's that those close to us can also be the ones that hurt us the most. I was new to America. I moved from place here and I had no idea where I can get things for a new accommodation that I was provided with the home and a transport to take me to one place to the other. I was from a very small town in Wales and to be in such a big city was a new one for me. New experiences, new adventures, and new people I got to visit. Being in the city was very transforming for me as the transitions were tough being from the small town and all. And then things became quite easier than before. The city was something that I was getting used to. I got the job in the Target corporate office, and I had to move all the way to America for the job that I was in San Francisco now for the job. It was a boring job, so telling the details of the job is a snooze fest in itself that no one should go through. But that is not why I chose the job. I did not choose the job because it was boring, but I took the job because it was a great opportunity to be overseas and to meet with new people and make friends with them and learn the American way of doing things. And it paid really well, so there's nothing bad with being paid good and to be in a country where there are quite a lot of opportunities. I moved to the corporate, and as per the requirement of the job, 
I had to get to one of the Target stores to operate well and inspect where they were lacking. It was mostly a mix of hands-on involvement and bit of paperwork to be taken care of. So I went inside this Target. It was already 6 in the evening, and I was already late due to the flight. It was a completely different state that I was in, so I marched in. And as I got close, I saw the physical condition of the store wasn't very good. The target sign wasn't completely working, and the store wasn't really maintained, and on the outside there was a group of guys that just kept hanging around. That seemed to be one of the reasons, too, that the store wasn't really performing. I called in the manager and asked him why are the guys on the outside just hanging around. They are blocking the potential customers, scaring them away from the store, and I told him to tell them to scram away from there. The manager didn't really listen at first, but then I also informed him about the other things. I told him that this is his responsibility to call the corporate office to come and surface the signs. And then when I asked him, I told you to get those boys to get away from the property. Tell them that they cannot hang around the property. They are scaring the customers away. And if there is something of a problem here, let me know. I will put on some sense in them. The man looked at me and then said, okay, I will tell them to go away. And I replied, don't tell them to just go away. Tell them they are not to come here and assemble. If they want to buy something, come right in and buy and leave. Don't gather. And I left to check some other things. And then 10 minutes into my inspection, I saw that there was a nuance created. A ruckus was going on outside the house. And I asked them what is going on. And one of the employees came running and said, sir, it is the manager. They are beating the manager. I quickly left my paperwork in my bag at the very aisle that I was standing at and inspecting, and ran towards the door and out in the area where the boys were hanging, and they were grabbing the manager by the collar and punching him. I got out and I heard one of the tall boys with black and hair with an evil smile say, something's right to the manager's space. You don't tell us nothing. Tell whoever shrimp you are working for, we are not moving anywhere. And as I got outside, the manager looked at me while he was getting his head bashed in and pointed the finger at me and said in the broken, beaten voice, Sir, you tell them to go away. I guess they are not really listening to what I have to say. And then I looked at him, seeing him all beaten on the floor. Hey man, I'm just a tourist. Why are you bringing me in a fight that has nothing to do with me? And I could see the anger and disappointment in the eyes of the manager at that time. Well, this was the corporate America. Everyone had to protect their own ass. So that is exactly what I was doing, or seemed like I was doing. The fight broke off. The manager only got bruises, nothing was broken, so that was a good start for him. He was really pissed at me for not taking a stand, but I got him a medical grant that the corporate gave in case anybody got injured during work. It was a whopping 50 grand, and he received, and I told him the very reason I did not interfere was to make his case strong. But you see, that is not just the case that I was transferred from Wales to America. I was not the corporate suck-up that I was pretending to be. I was so much more than that. That night, when those idiots beat up our store manager, we were able to gather the information on those hooligans. My line of work involves intimidation, and my job was to make sure that the people who were supposed to be scared of the power of the target were scared of it. I was keeping the accounts on them, so the boys that seemed not very afraid of that manager in Target had to get the taste of what power Target has, and I was the guy that sent to rough up guys like them. That same night, I went into their houses and made sure they remember what it feels like to mess with the wrong company, and they were quick to understand. So other than the boring paperwork, there was something else that I brought in from all the way in Wales. I was the accountant that people hoped that they didn't see. For more than a hundred years now, both Boy Scouts and Girl Scouts have sat around roaring log fires at night and carried on the rich tradition of telling campfire tales. For the most part, these stories have detailed the murderous exploits of all kinds of boogeymen, monsters, and cryptids. Yet some touch on another oft-told urban legend, that of the deranged psycho killer, the escaped asylum patient, hell-bent on the meaningless slaughter of innocents. However, as terrifying as these stories may be, we still use them for entertainment purely on the premise that they're completely fictional that the monsters we're so afraid of can't really hurt us. There aren't any real psychopathic killers out there in the woods, are there? But maybe it'd be best to hear the story of the Oklahoma Girl Scout murders before we make any definitive judgment on that. Nestled into Mays County, Oklahoma, Camp Scott used to be one of the Sooner State's premier Girl Scout camps. 
It's also one of the oldest, with the year 1977 being the 50th anniversary of its founding. Camp Scott also happens to be located on 410 acres of the most beautiful land in the entire country, with the surrounding area comprised of gently sloping hills, Tolkien-esque forests, and a tranquil freshwater creek. Interspersed in the area are a series of platform tent clusters which host any visitors. For those who were never scouts as kids, a platform tent is a large canvas tent pitched semi-permanently on a raised wooden platform, sometimes with a tin roof or tarp on top. It can usually sleep four to six people and has zippers on both sides of the tent to close the inner flap, with ties to close the outer and side flaps. There is no way to 100% close the tent in a secure way, but it is generally sturdier of an option than tent camping on the ground, and platform tents are somewhere between a cabin and a tent in terms of comfort. Like many Girl Scout camps, the tents at Camp Scott were arranged in small campsites scattered throughout the camp, each with fire pits and related amenities, with each named after a Native American tribe. You could be forgiven for thinking the camp was an outdoor paradise, a serene, wholesome slice of Eden, brimming with innocence, far from the hustle and bustle of the big city. But just a short while before the camp season of 1977, a training session was held in which veteran camp counselors would coach the incoming counselors in training on what would be expected of them. One of these counselors picked up a box of donuts on the way over, finding that a sweet treat made for a great conversation starter among the new arrivals and generally made them feel more welcomed. She shared a few of the donuts among her fellow counselors, but left the remaining donuts back near the counselor campground when she took the new arrivals on a tour of the area. When she returned, the donuts were gone, and in their place was a filthy handwritten note that bore just three scrawled words. Three will die. The girl immediately showed the note to one of the camp's head of operations, but instead of taking the threat seriously, they dismissed the note as nothing but a tasteless prank and instructed the counselors to go about their business as usual. On the first day of camp season, Girl Scouts from all four corners of Oklahoma were bussed into Camp Scott to begin the first of many week-long visits. The mood was generally high among the young women, as school had recently finished and that summer break elation was still very much at its peak. But that Sunday, June 12th, was hardly an ideal summer's day. Thick fogs and misty rains had turned the camp into a complete soaked mess. Yet the Girl Scouts' spirits weren't dampened and they remained positive as they were split into groups and shown to their respective campgrounds. Thankfully, the weather relented enough for the girls to partake in a few camp activities before sundown. But as night fell, the rain resumed with a vengeance, and what had previously been a light smattering of drizzle turned into a full-on downpour. To keep from being soaked, the Girl Scouts rushed back to their platform tents to bed down early, confident that the weather would improve so they could return to their wholesome outdoor fun. The following morning, one of the counselors collected her wash kit and headed over to the camp's shower block. This shower block just so happened to be right at the rear of the camp near a collection of platform tents known as Kiowa, and thanks to the horseshoe arrangement of the platforms, one of them was ever so slightly obscured from view by the shower block itself. So at around 6am on the 13th of June, this counselor headed down the hillside to the trail which led to the bathhouse, but as she approached, she spotted three apparently occupied bags just lying there on the trail, sleeping bags that had been piled up against each other in a disturbingly unnatural way. There was no way there would be Girl Scouts in there. There was no way anyone could sleep like that. No one living, anyway. Because when the young counselor unzipped the sleeping bags to peek at what was inside, the entire camp was awoken by a blood-curdling scream. Inside the sleeping bags were 8-year-old Lori Lee Farmer, 9-year-old Michelle Heather Goose, and 10-year-old Doris Denise Miller. Each had their skulls bashed in by a large blunt object, with at least two of them showing signs of heavy strangulation. The camp was immediately evacuated while one of the camp's directors contacted the local police force. Sniffer dogs were brought in to search for clues and a single unknown fingerprint was taken from one of the girls' flashlights, 
and a bloody size nine and a half footprint was found in the tent the girls were missing from. Shortly after the camp was closed off as a crime scene, police interviewed a nearby homeowner who reportedly heard something rather heavy on the small road running between the camp and his property at around 3 a.m. on the morning of the 13th. Since all the counselors had solid alibis for the determined times of death, it was deduced that this must have been the killer moving to and from the area. After a large-scale manhunt was launched to flush out the murderer, local and federal law enforcement honed in on a man named Gene Leroy Hart. Hart already had multiple convictions for indecent assault, attempted murder, burglary, and escaping federal custody. And although he lived out near Tulsa at the time of the murders, it turned out that he grew up in a house less than a mile away from Camp Scott. It also turned out that Gene Leroy Hart was of Native American heritage, Cherokee to be exact, so police began to canvass the local charity community in hopes that they could assist them in tracking Hart down. Despite being somewhat distrustful of the visiting police officers, it said that once the local Cherokee learned that Hart was wanted in connection with the murder of three little girls, they fell over themselves to aid in the investigation. Eventually, a Cherokee man contacted the police by telephone, informing them of a rumor that Hart was sheltering in the isolated, traditional home of a well-known medicine man. And although the place proved difficult to find, police found the tip to be a good one. Hart was arrested there and then, with the medicine man insisting he had no idea Hart was accused of such a heinous crime. According to him, Hart had merely confessed to doing something terrible, although he wouldn't specify exactly what it was. At his trial for the girl's murders, the local sheriff claimed that he was 1000% sure that Hart was the guilty party. Yet despite the man's blind certainty, there was a number of holes in the prosecution's argument that were too significant to discount. The most pertinent being that Hart didn't wear a nine and a half size shoe, meaning it couldn't have been him that stepped in the girl's blood back at Camp Scott. The prosecution argued that a man could easily wear a size too small or too large and that the defense's argument was a flimsy one. However, when all the evidence was taken into consideration, the jury simply couldn't find Hart guilty beyond all reasonable doubt. Hart had a violent past, that much is clear, but to scapegoat him purely to sate rabid public demands for justice would be hideously unfair. Of course, there was a chance he was guilty. There was plenty of circumstantial evidence, but a man should only be locked in a cage for the rest of his life if the jury are, as the sheriff so clumsily put it, 1,000% certain. To their credit, the jury found Hart not guilty of the murders, and he walked away a free man. Yet this freedom was short-lived. After later violating his parole conditions, Hart was sent back to prison to finish his original 308-year prison sentence. You heard that right. The crimes that Hart had previously been convicted of were so utterly atrocious and prolific that a judge had seen fit to sentence him to more than 300 years in a federal penitentiary. He died of a heart attack in the prison exercise yard just two years later, but on the advent of DNA testing, police had the means to close the book on the Oklahoma Girl Scout murderers once and for all. When test results came back, police were stunned to discover that the chances of Hart being the girl's killer was almost 1 in 8,000. The victims' families have since demanded that more modern equipment be used in the hopes of getting more accurate readings, but law enforcement have insisted that the chances of an alternate result coming back are slim to none. As for the site of the murders, Camp Scott was never reopened to the public, becoming far too associated with a horrifying unsolved tragedy in which three young girls needlessly lost their lives. And without anyone convicted, there was no way anyone was going to send their kids to Camp Scott while the killer still stalked the area. These days, there's little left but forest where the camp once stood, nothing to remind anyone of the three little girls who only ever wanted to have a fun summer at camp, but never returned home. I'm your typical 21-year-old American girl. I grew up in the suburbs and had a pretty nice upbringing. 
Unfortunately, I had been a total party girl up until the time I turned 20. That was when I started getting my stuff together. I nearly died of alcohol poisoning one night, and despite being surrounded by some of my friends, nobody even bothered to help me. Even when it was obvious that something was wrong, I'm not going to lie to you, I was a really crummy person when I was younger. One of the things I remember doing with my friends was teasing a really unpopular kid. I get asked out by a fair amount of guys, and I'm not the ugliest girl in the world. My friends and I all had an Algebra 2 class towards the end of high school, and one of the boys in it always seemed to be checking me out. I really regret being mean and teasing him because he was honestly a pretty nice kid, just kind of socially awkward and completely lacking in any sense of fashion or style. One day after class, my friends and I were talking about a party for that weekend. He must have been listening in on our conversation because he came up to me and asked if I needed someone to go to the party with. I don't really know what he was expecting, but I went with it on a whim. I told him that I really needed a nice guy to go with me so people would think I have a boyfriend. He agreed to go with me and said that he would pick me up before the party. We exchanged phone numbers and that was that. My friends and I were already plotting on how we were going to embarrass him on the night of the party. I told him that it was a professional party. He told me that he had to go out and buy a tuxedo then. Me, being the horrible person I was back then, totally agreed. He picked me up in his mom's car before the party on Friday night. He even brought me flowers. It was at that point that I started to feel guilty and kind of wanted to abandon the whole thing. I couldn't do it though. My friends would have been really mad at me. They got two giant tubs of mayonnaise that they were going to pour on top of him. It was my job to have him stand for a picture and get him in the right position. Then, I will tell them that I had to go to the bathroom real quick and for him to stay in place, and that's when my friends were going to pour the mayonnaise on him. Again, I regret that whole role I played in this whole thing. I even felt guilty at the moment when I walked away, and I actually went to the bathroom. I didn't want to watch it happen. From what I heard, he started crying and went back to his car and drove home immediately. I thought that would have sent some kind of a signal that I really wasn't interested in dating him. Well, he didn't quite get that signal, because he still kept trying to talk to me and go out on another date. He even tried asking me where I went that night and it made me feel even worse than I already did because he didn't even realize that I was in on the joke. Like he thinks he randomly got mayonnaised. As guilty as I felt, I just tried to ignore him and hope the problem would go away on its own. We only had another month or so of algebra and it was every other day, so I figured the number of times I had to see him were limited. Well, he never actually got the hint. He found me on Facebook and messaged me on there. He somehow found my phone number, which I still don't quite understand how he did it either. Suffice to know that he still regularly made an attempt to date me for a very long time. I tell you this story not for fun or to brag, but because this guy, Donald was his name, continued his interest in me for six years. Still, even to this very day, we've been out of high school for years now and he still messages me or reaches out in some way every few weeks. After I started getting my life together, I tried explaining to him that I wasn't interested in him, but he never really got the message. I work a night shift job now, at a gas station on the edge of town. For the most part, we only really ever got truckers and the occasional traveler. Anything else is pretty rare, but sometimes on certain nights, around 3 o'clock in the morning, Donald will show up, and he's not looking to get gas, he's looking to get me. It's only happened three times now, but they were honestly pretty horrifying and I nearly called the police the last time. I think I will if he shows up again. The first time he showed up where I worked, he tried pretending like it was a coincidence. Like, oh hey, I didn't know you worked here, I was just buying one candy bar at a gas station at 3 o'clock in the morning. You know, the usual. And that night was really weird. The second time he came by, he told me that it was a long drive from his house to the gas station, but he said that it was worth it because the candy bars at this gas station were the best. Bear in mind, this guy was buying plain Hershey milk chocolate candy bars every time he came in, and not in bulk either. Literally just one every single time he came in. Like, could you get any weirder? This last time that he came though, that was the time that really freaked me out. 
He's a lot rougher now that he's been out of high school. I think he works at some kind of manual labor job, or maybe he's just a dirty person. He always looks really disheveled when he comes in. And he walked into the gas station, bought his usual chocolate bar, but instead of leaving, he just stood there. I was standing at the cash register, just kind of awkwardly waiting for him to go, but I handed him back his change and receipt and just watched him stand there and stare at me, like dead on staring me in the eye. I felt extremely uncomfortable and didn't know exactly how to end the social interaction. I asked him if he needed anything else, but he just said no and then continued staring at me. That was when he reached over the counter and tried holding my hand. I could tell by the look on his face that he had some sort of intimate intentions in his mind, something devious. As freaked out as I was, I pulled my hand back as fast as I could and told him that he had to go. Why are you going to be like that? I love chasing you, but you got to give in one day, he said to me. That was when I told him that I was not interested in him at all and the only reason I went on a date with him was because I was in on the joke to pour the mayonnaise on him. I told him that I wouldn't date him if he was the last guy on earth and that I would never be interested in him. I saw his facial expression go from nefarious to angry. He knocked a bunch of gum off of the gum rack before storming out. Before he walked out the door though, he stopped and looked me right in the eye and said, I'll have you one day, you little pretty princess. And then he left. I had no idea how to respond. I don't even know what to do about the situation. He's not really doing anything illegal, I don't think, other than knocking things over. If I see him again, though, I might have to call the police. If this isn't stalking, then it comes pretty darn close. And the part that kills me about the whole thing is that I just want to put that phase of my life behind me. I don't want to think about being popular or partying or being mean to kids like him. I just want to save up some money, get my life together and maybe find a good boyfriend, but yeah. That's my ongoing situation with a very creepy guy I played a prank on from high school. And looking back, I never should have gone along with it. I should have followed my intuition and done the right thing. Instead, I guess I have to pay my dues for what I have done in some way. Maybe this is some weird form of justice. I was born and raised in South Carolina. It was always tough living there because I'm an African American lady. My family and I grew up in an upper middle class neighborhood. Both my parents are immigrants who worked hard to give my siblings and I a good life. So it was a Saturday evening when my parents went out on a date. I was 14 at the time and they trusted I would be able to babysit my little brother and sister. I'd done this a million times before so I wasn't worried. They left the house at around 8 and promised to be back no later than 11pm. Everything seemed perfectly fine at first. My brother was in the first living room playing on his Xbox. I was on the couch near him using my phone and my sister was upstairs in our room messing with her tablet. Now the layout of the house was something like this. You open the front door and immediately to your right you have the first living room. That leads into a dining room which leads into the kitchen. The kitchen is open and leads into the second living room. From there you can access the backyard and door to the garage. On the left of the front door you can go up the stairs to the bedrooms. On one side of the hall you have my sister and I's room and a bathroom and on the other you have the master bedroom and my brother's room. I'm sitting on the couch with my brother. I then hear the garage door being opened. It was only around 9pm and I knew my parents would never come back home this early. So I got up to meet them at the door and see why. Whenever they leave I always make sure the door from the garage is locked so I usually have to let them in. I walk up to the door and just as I was about to open it, I stopped. I felt kind of anxious for whatever reason and didn't want to open up the door until I heard it was them. I see the doorknob wiggle violently and I got scared and stepped back. I called out. Mom? No response. Dad, is that you? Stop messing around. Nothing. I started to get really scared. 
Dad, if this is you, please say something. I'm getting scared. After I said this, the wiggling got way more violent. It looked like the door was going to burst at any moment. By this point, my brother stopped playing his game and ran into the kitchen. Fearing for our lives, I ran into the kitchen, grabbed one of the biggest knives we had, took my brother's hand and ran upstairs. There I grabbed my sister and ran into my brother's room. By now I heard the door burst open. I locked the door and hid my siblings in the closet while I pushed the dresser in front of the door to barricade it. After I did that I sat on his bed and called the cops. The operator got all of my details and said the cops would be there in five minutes. As I sat on the bed I felt absolutely terrified. My mind was completely blank until I heard running up the stairs. The light sobbing in the closet from my siblings turned into fearful screams and I had my back against the wall shaking as I held the knife in front of me. I heard them bust through each door. Eventually they got to the end of the hall where my brother's room is and tried to open the door. They got angry and started banging and yelling at us to open up. I could tell by the voice that it was a man. Eventually he's able to bust the lock and slide the door open. We lock eyes as he tries to get past my little makeshift barricade. I get a good look at his face and his features. He couldn't have been more than 5'10 and had a stocky build and a very deep voice. He had, at least to me, very obviously gotten cosmetic surgery. His face looked incredibly artificial. His skin had this unnatural smoothness to it. He had these glossy big lips and his eyes seemed to be just a little too big and I was on the verge of tears when I just yelled, Don't come any closer! The police are on their way! That seemed to stop him in his tracks. He took one last look at me when he ran down the stairs and out the front door. I ran to the closet to check on my siblings and see if they were alright. They were pretty shaken up, but other than that, they were okay. I heard the police finally pull up to my house about a minute later. An officer came in and yelled to see if we were alright. I remember being taken to the station with my siblings and calling my parents on the way too. We filed a report, but nothing came of it. I remember being so angry about it. There couldn't be that many people who looked like that in South Carolina. How was it so hard to find someone who left the crime scene within minutes before them arriving? <laughs>